It is Tuesday night in East Lansing, Michigan. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Gather in, gather in, gather round, gather round. Come on in. Tell us where you're watching from. Let us know how you're doing. Want to wish a Happy New Year to all Michigan State fans. Spartan fans all over the state, all over the country, all over the world. We used to have the one guy that used to chime in from Hong Kong. I don't think we've heard him heard from him in a little bit, but hope he's doing well. Hope everybody's doing well. Want to wish everybody a great, safe, happy new year, happy January 2024. I think 2024 is going to be good for Michigan State. A lot of building blocks going to be put in place for Michigan State football. Basketball going to do something similar to last year, I think. I'm not as convinced that they are going to be um, – you know, last year at this time and throughout January when they were having problems, I'm like, hey, they have Sweet 16 potential, and Sweet 16 is a good season. Sweet 16, overtime, almost Elite Eight. I'm not as convinced that they are going to do that this year. The Joey Hauser thing was a big deal last year. Michigan State has their problems here and there. Did not play well against Northwestern. Everybody saw that on Sunday. I was at practice today. Is a press conference video here on the channel. You can find that here at the SpartanMag.com channel. In the meantime, make sure you like the channel. That really helps a lot. And if you like this or any other content, share that with your friends. Share that with your enemies. Share that with people you don't even know. And it helps us a lot. Give us a like. Subscribe to the channel. Go to SpartanMag.com. Become a SpartanMag.com subscriber. We'd really appreciate that. Michigan State basketball, people have been asking me about that game against Northwestern. First of all, Northwestern's good. What are they, 10-3? and three? They beat Purdue, beat Michigan State. I know they lost to Chicago State, which is a shocker. Because I don't mean to say anything bad about Chicago State, but the only time I ever hear about Chicago State in basketball is when they're losing to somebody like 110 to 40. And I've never heard about Chicago State ever beating anyone ever in my life. They beat Northwestern somehow, but Northwestern looked real good against Michigan State. They beat Purdue. Tom Izzo thought that Northwestern looked even better against Michigan State than they did against Purdue. And I would agree with that defensively in some ways. I don't know. They looked, they looked pretty good against Purdue, and Purdue is good. Purdue is not without. They have some chinks in their armor like they did last year, but Michigan State against Northwestern, okay, what's going on there? First of all, Northwestern's good. Secondly, Northwestern played really well. Thirdly, you know, Izzo talks about the ebbs and flows and the ups and downs of most teams all over the country. He likes to point out Arizona losing by 20 to, to um, California, then beating Colorado by 40. That's an extreme example. Michigan State might be the, the most extreme example. And Michigan State's done this over a number of years, every year. You know, you look at that top 25, there's teams that are winning ugly like Kansas. There's teams that are winning that are beating nobodies like Oklahoma. I think they're 13-1, and one, and I like Porter, Porter Mosier a lot. Really good coach. They didn't schedule real hard. I think they beat Iowa, lost to North Carolina. I think they beat Iowa State. They haven't beat anyone else really of note. And yet, Oklahoma's like number 13, 14 in the country. If you look at Ken Palm, which I don't always agree with, but Ken Palm has Michigan State number 20 in the country, and I think Oklahoma 21, which is an interesting comparison you know I mean Michigan State loses to Duke Arizona Wisconsin top 15 team and in the Ken Palm you still get credit for that if you play tough against some of those teams and then you beat Baylor it helps but Michigan State losses one and three in the Big Ten the losses are adding up it's not good right now they go and they play number nine ranked Illinois at Illinois good chance coming out of that one and four and, you know, I was talking to Carson Cooper about that after practice today, and he said, yeah, you know, um, it's getting pretty serious. It's always been serious, but they're looking at it like, go get a win, come back home, get another win, and get back to even at 3-3. Three and three. That's their battle cry. Problem is, you're playing a very good Illinois team. I know they don't have Shannon, um, not supposed to have Terrence Shannon, but Izzo's complaining about that a little bit because Izzo's big on video, getting prepared for the opponent, getting into the opponent's scouting report, and getting prepared for it and getting his players to know the personnel and getting into their tendencies like they did against Baylor and like they usually do when they get toward March. You play Illinois, they don't have Shannon. What adjustments are they going to make? Michigan State doesn't know. I mean, they played one game without him. I think it was one game without him. Um, lost to Purdue. They were down by 20, came back, make a run, run at them, ended up losing by double digits. 
Illinois is good. Number nine in the country. On the road. Tough place to play. Talented. Difficult matchup because they've got size all around the perimeter. 6'4", 6'5", 6'6", 6'7", 6'8". Shooting center at Hawkins at 6'10". Dane Danger, Dane Danger, the big man who really bothered Michigan State last year, hurt Michigan State last year. He's not been playing much this year. I asked some Illinois people about that, and they're like, well, his ball screen defense is not real great. He plays drop coverage. They'd rather not play drop coverage. I know Michigan State is, compar- is preparing for all of it. Shannon, Danger, all of it. Meanwhile, Michigan State, they got home late on Sunday, took Monday off, practice today, practice Wednesday, travel, going back on the road. Day and a half prep, two-day prep with the mandatory day off. Meanwhile, Illinois, I think, played Friday. They'll get six days off for this game, and they're coming off a loss to Purdue. Some teams, when they lose, if they lose too many times, they lose interest, the coach loses the team, and it all spirals down downward like Juwan Howard is experiencing at Michigan right now. We've seen some Michigan teams do that. You know, Kalen Lucas's senior year. They started losing, and they never quite regained it. Quality teams like Northwestern and Illinois or Michigan State coming off a loss is when good coaches get good teams to really focus in. We saw that with Michigan State against Baylor. We saw that with Northwestern having lost by 30 to Illinois. Good team at home really focused in against a red-letter opponent and Northwestern played their best game of the day, of the year. Very good on defense, good with the traps, like we wrote in pre-snap read. Trap, recover, force turnovers. Very good at that stuff. Meanwhile, they shot really well. And Boo Booey with the first double-double of his career with 10 assists. Doing a great job getting open shots for people. They made them. Hey, Northwestern's 10-3. and They're good. They beat Purdue. Do I have to remind anybody that Northwestern went to the NCAA tournament last year? And they beat UCLA in the tournament, went to the second round. It's not your father's Northwestern. Pretty good team. Yet, they were coming off a 30-point loss to Illinois. So a good team playing at home. Red-letter game against Michigan State. Coming off a loss like that, optimal. Optimal focus, energy, urgency for Northwestern. They played like it. Michigan State had just won, what, four straight, five straight? 90% focus, 90%. Urgency, that'll get you down by 10 points in the Big Ten real real quickly. That's what, what it was, down by 10. And you watched it. Izzo was aggravated by putbacks, offensive rebounds, seven of them in the first 10, 12 minutes. Carson Cooper got beat for two offensive rebounds. He was trying to box guy out, but just gave up offensive rebounds to Luke Hunger, I think it was. A.J. Hogard, you know, Hogard's a guy that um, Izzo really complimented in terms of his energy and focus and leadership in that game and the whole road trip and all that stuff. And it was, Izzo was the first one to criticize A.J. Hogard. So when Izzo is being complimentary, you know that he's seeing something behind the scenes that he really likes. And those two are interacting really well at practice today. They always do. Um, Izzo likes the way he's wired, just wants to get the wiring in the right direction, and it looks like it's that way now. However, Hogard gave up one of those offensive rebounds in the first 10, 12 minutes. <clears throat> just flat out didn't... Shot goes up, didn't even look at his guy. Shot went up, and he just kind of loitered toward the rim. His guy got the rebound. And I can't remember if his guy scored or it went back out for a three or what. But that's urgency. That's middle school stuff. And I'm sure Hogard felt bad about it when they showed video. Xavier Booker, same thing happened to him. Didn't look to box out his guy. Shot goes up, loiters. The guy goes around him, gets the offensive rebound, puts it back up and in. Four points here couple points there. Defensive switch, Aikens and Walker. Defensive switch, lost a guy. I think it was Langhorn, Langborg, whatever his name is, hits a three. Those things were not happening against Baylor when Michigan State was urgent and focused. Yeah, you can say you should be urgent and focused every single game, and Izzo would love to find out what you need to do to make that happen because it's hard for coaches to do that. It's hard to get up for every single game. And you don't need to get up to A-plus level, but they caught... Northwestern's A-plus level. Now, Michigan State, all that being said, coming off a loss, should Michigan State be up to A-plus level for this game? At Illinois, red-letter game, yes, they could, they should. Two days prep, not ideal. Problem is, Illinois is coming off that loss to Purdue with six days prep. 
So whatever edge you think Michigan State might have for the urgency of a loss, Illinois is going to have that and then some. It's going to be very hard to win that game. So if they lose and they're 1-4, and four, it won't be the first time Izzo's been 1-4. and four. I'll have to look, up, look it up. But I agree with what Izzo said today. This is a good team, not a great team yet. Um, the wins and losses, when the losses add up, you end up on the NCAA tournament bubble, and that can be a drag. You end up with a tough seed. You have to play a team like Marquette in the second round. It makes it difficult. Last year, Marquette. So, um, not ideal that Michigan State's losing games. Not as good as last year. Don't have the Hauser element. Malik Hall's working on a shot. I'm not sure it's ever going to get there. So, they're going to have to win in other ways. And not sure it's going to get there to the Sweet 16 level. But I'm not closing the door on it. If they lose these games, people are going to continue to jump off the bandwagon and light their hair on fire and pour kerosene on themselves and all kinds of terrible things. We don't want that to happen. Get a grip. It's going to be okay. Um, I think I've not even looked at the Big Ten schedule and what Michigan State has coming up in the coming days and weeks after this. I know they play Rutgers at home on Sunday. But I think Michigan State's good enough to get on another winning streak. Beating Indiana State, that's a big win. Indiana State's better, I would say, than half the teams in the Big Ten given that was at home. But um, I think Michigan State can harness a level of play that should allow them to collect wins as they improve. And usually after they get about 75 practices in, that's when the defense really starts to check catch hold for Michigan State. Also, it's like Michigan State needs to lose some games for Izzo's teaching to really catch hold, you know, gain traction to get players to understand, guys, this is what we need to do to win at the level we want to win. Now, they've got enough veterans. They shouldn't need to do that. But look at Hogard missing a box out. Okay. Aikens is playing good defense lately. That wasn't the case a month ago, so he's on the right track in that regard. His shot has improved. That's good. So, um, good chance they're going to lose at Illinois, but um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when that happens. Let's go to the questions. Sorry about that lengthy basketball soliloquy. What do we have here? Just making sure. Don't have anything crazy going on. All right, so questions. What we do here over at SpartanMag.com, we invite SpartanMag.com subscribers to post at the Underground Bunker message board questions that they have for Spartan Mag Live over at the Underground Bunker message board, which is the church of what's happening now, the daily narrative on Michigan State sports, SpartanMag.com's premium message board. The Underground Bunker have been doing it since the 1990s. Happy with it. And those questions, we answer them here mailbag style let's go to question number one i lost my notes all right question number one this is from josie's joe ski sparty in west bloomfield michigan is there a current defensive back that can make the move to linebacker for michigan state and where are we going to get help at that position uh, also, if you're over in the comments section, we will be taking questions over there as well. And please let us know where you are chiming in from, where you're posting from, where you're watching from. Um, defensive backs, you know, off the top of my head, you know, someone else uh, on the questions in the mailbag area mentioned Armorion Smith, the transfer from Cincinnati. And I'm not sure, you know, he mentioned Armarion Smith being about 6'2", 105. Actually, Armarion is 6'1". I don't think he's quite, I don't think he's linebacker material. I know what you're talking about, about a guy that can move from DB to safety. I can't think of anyone in the in the program right now, maybe some of these new recruits. I've not really eyeballed them to see who might be a bigger framed guy. I've not spoken with the new coaches to ask them if they have that in mind for any of the players. So currently on the roster, I can't think of a defensive back that might be able to slide to that linebacker position like Darius Snow did and like several others have done in the past. In terms of linebackers, um, they do need some help there still. They have Jordan Hall coming back. They have Jordan Turner transferring in from Wisconsin. And, you know, beyond that, you know, they signed Brady Pretzlaff, true freshman. I think he's got it. He's going to have to get have a chance to get in there and compete for something in the two deep walk on Sam Edwards from East Lansing, still in the program, Cal Halliday in the program. I forgot to mention him. Sorry about that. Halliday's a functional proven player. You can talk about everything that he's not, but I'm assuming he's coming back. Um, 
Michigan State's not in a position where they can have a Cal Halliday move on. They're not going to, as this is a, this is a cliche you're going to get tired of hearing me say, but they're not bringing anybody from the tennis team in to play linebacker. And Cal Halliday is going to be a fifth year senior, proven functional player. I'm not saying he's Carl Banks, but Michigan State's not in a position where guys like that can just just let them get away. Michigan State played that game against Penn State at Ford Field. I mean, this close to having to use a tuba player at linebacker. Late in the season, they traveled with like four scholarship linebackers. It was a problem. They were thin. Now you ask about Ma'an Nateote. I've not heard from him or seen him since the spring. He's posted some stuff on social media, unrelated to Michigan State here and there. I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. I've not heard anything. Um, um, in, um, you know, for sure about what his situation is, but I, I, I'm not expecting to be a part of it. Maybe I'm wrong about that. We've not had a chance to ask coaches about it either. I remember when Mel Tucker was first hired, um, the offensive line coach had a Zoom call because it was COVID, and I asked about an offensive lineman who was in a similar situation. It might have been Cole Chewins, who I think had an extra year of eligibility, and I asked him about it. And um, Kapilovic was like, I, I don't know who you're talking about. No, they, he's not on my list. That's that's probably what, what might happen when I ask um, Rossi, the new defensive coordinator, about linebackers, ask about Nateote. They might be like, who are you talking about? He's not on my list. I don't know. So, hey, maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe he'll show up. I'm not sure. You know, Aaron Alexander got on the field a little bit. Darius Snow says he has his speed back. I'm not sure about that. If that's the truth, I mean, we'll, we, we will be looking for that during spring practice if we, if we get a chance to watch much. If that's true, that'll be a plus. I'll believe it when I see it because that injury was was uh, severe. And he came back this year, did what he could. Credit to him. He's got a lot of heart, got a lot of soul, did what he could. But um, if, if he has his speed back like he says, then he can be a factor. If not... He's just kind of a stopgap guy that's – you give him credit for doing his thing, but I'm not sure he can help a lot. But at this point, they're going to need some people to play snaps. I think Turner and Hall, Halliday, those three, you mix in Alexander, Pretzlaff, Snow, and you have a competition. There's a pool there, some experience there, but they're still looking for another linebacker, and we will get to that later. They're in, in the portal. They had two visit this weekend, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it right now. Um, Wayne Matthews from Old Dominion, 6'2", 225 from Largo, Maryland, and also x Alexander from Idaho, from uh, Auburn, Washington. And um, it, it's looking good. For, it was looking good for, for either player. It was looking good, but um, I'm getting a note from Jason Killip right now that Alexander is likely to go to Central Florida. Alexander's a guy on the West Coast that Pac-12 teams offered, but he ended up at Idaho. Not really sure what happened there, but uh, as a transfer, he's been offered by Washington, Nebraska, California, Washington State, Kansas, Michigan State. Now it's looking like Central Florida, so I'm not sure what's going on there. 6'2", 215 for Idaho. Had 75 tackles this year. Um, you know, was a mid-level three-star recruit and has some talent as a young guy. as a freshman. He has three years of eligibility left, but Jason's hearing right now, it's looking like Alexander is going to go to Central Florida. Go to SpartanMag.com. If you're watching this and you're not a subscriber already, get over there. $1 for a month. Give it a trial run. We'll think that, we think that you'll like it. If you're liking this, you'll love that. Sorry the video's grainy if you're just joining us. Got some new equipment here, and we've got, we've got more horsepower in terms of the hardware, but the lighting thing has gone a little bit shaky, so we apologize about that. As for other linebackers, Wayne Matthews from Old Dominion out of Largo, Maryland, 6'2", 225. He's third team all Sun Belt. And that's what I'm talking about. I like guys that were all conference at the mid-major level. Jacoby Winman was that type of guy. Now, I mean, if you can get all conference at, at a power five, that's even better. Of course, obviously. But if you're Michigan State out here trying to fill out a roster, that's the type of guy that catches my eye. Um... In the bowl game against Western Kentucky, he had 14 tackles, one sack. I watched a little bit of that. In 2023, he had 135 tackles, 3.5 sacks. That's a lot of activity. I watched him a little bit. He's also visited Mississippi State. 
but it sounds like Michigan State's in good shape with Matthews. You add Matthews in there, he's got one year of eligibility, I think. That would help the talent pool. I'm not saying he's Carl Banks. Uh, when you watch him on film, you know, you'd like to you'd like him to be a little more fluid, but and a little more explosive, but but he's he's functional. And, you know, he can help. Is he as good as Brule or Winman? Maybe not. But um you know, might not be a starter either, but maybe I'm wrong about that. You know, you, you put him in here with some new coaching and maybe even more traction, but, you know, and, and I'm, I don't mean to throw damp water on everything, but I'm not going to hear, sit here and tell you that everybody is Lawrence Taylor either. And I've, I've watched some film. I've not watched everything start to finish. So I might be wrong about some of that, but you have Hall, Turner, Halliday, and then you're looking for a fourth, but there'll be times when Michigan State plays a, an old school four three when they play Michigan when they I don't even remember who's on the schedule next year but if they I don't even know if they play Minnesota Wisconsin Iowa um, but there'll be times against some opponents when they'll play three linebackers Oregon State um, Minnesota did that with Rossi they were a base two linebacker defense but when they played you know heavier offenses like Iowa and Wisconsin, they would go to a 4-3. They could do it naturally and smoothly with the players that they had up until 2022. Last year, Minnesota was hurt by graduation, didn't quite have the experience that they loved at linebacker the year before, linebacker and safety. But long-term, when you play a team that goes 12 personnel or 21 personnel, they will they won't be sticking in a in a 4-2-5. It'll be it'll be a 4-3. So You'll need six linebackers for those situations. Hall, Turner, Halliday. Matthews, if he commits, which we're kind of expecting. Pretzlaff. Aaron Alexander, Darius Snow. It's competition. You got some capability in there. It's not as thin as it was at the end of this season. But as they build the program, it's going to be building blocks, stair steps, stair steps. And I like Pretz laugh going forward. Question two, Matt in Grand Rapids. He says, uh, with D'Antonio joining the College Football Hall of Fame, do you have a favorite Coach D story? You know, I read this during rehearsal. And I'm like, do I have a great story? I mean, usually I just have to react and bounce off of things. And I don't, I, you know, and I, and I left this one blank give me a little you know an hour or so to think about it then I got caught up with some other stuff and I don't have a great story I mean I, there's there's so many um you know he wasn't Mr. Jokester guy by any means serious and I got great respect for him he was so good for college football good for the football program good for the athletic department good for Michigan State University good person honorable man honorable man and you know I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't. One of the things, uh, I was going to say one of the things that came to my mind. I just, when I was at the college, at the, uh, the Peach Bowl in 2021, December, 2021, I was at a restaurant and we were there a few hours with a couple of friends of mine, some of whom might be watching right now. And D'Antonio was with some people and he was leaving and some of my friends stopped him and said hi and stuff. And I didn't say a word. And, you know, 20, 30 seconds later, D'Antonio sees me and he goes, Jimmy, my man. And uh, that was cool. I, you know, I, the only reason I, I give that story is because I started to say that that's what popped in my, into my mind. And then I was like, I don't want to tell that story because it sounds self-serving. But it was cool. Um, of course, I don't cover him professionally anymore. At that point, I didn't. Then this year we did for a little bit again. But that was good, you know, um, in terms of football things, I'll just have to move on because that, that's why I, this is why I go over the store, the questions before the show, because I don't want to read it for the first time cold and have to sit and brainstorm. You guys don't want to sit and watch me brainstorm. So, but there for a second, you saw me brainstorming about D'Antonio because I choked because I didn't, uh, I didn't have a good story ready. Uh, what, what does that say? Do I need to shut that one down? Yeah, go ahead and call. I'll turn the phone on here if you want to call the show. It's kind of grainy. It looks like it's snowing in the stadium, doesn't it? I'm not sure why that is. I mean, I, I do know why it is because the lighting sucks tonight. And it's the same lighting I always have. It's just a different computer situation. 
and it's bothering me. I don't know. We'll have to run some more tests later. Anyway, apologize about that, but couldn't get it straightened out. Let's go over here to the comments area. We've got leading off. We got old Tuck. Old Tuck coming in from Austin, Texas by way of Ludington, Michigan. Great to have old Tuck here. He is uh, first guy in. He is the bell cow. He's down low. Throwing his elbows around. Make the best of what's around. Wants to run the point. Yes, he can run the point. Thomas Kohlberg, he's a shooter. He's in the wing. John Elke, he's a shooter. Checking in from Clarkston. You know he can shoot. Checking in from Clarkston. I played against Ed Whitaker. Do you remember him? Well, by the time I got in the court, the game was over. And Ed was sitting down and they were up by 30. Kylan, 45, checking in from Cleveland, Ohio. He's, uh, he's our power forward. My guy from Cleveland, he's going to be a dirty power forward, too. He's not going to fancy Dan shooter, stretch for stuff. He's going to be Antonio Smith, elbow to the esophagus, power forward. Kylan, 45, from Cleveland. King Clom, 45, coming off the bench. King Clom, 45, is a scrappy two-guard. Thank you for the added information. Appreciate that. Old Tuck from Austin, Texas says, Izzo mentioning being small at guard today. Hogard and Akins are 6'4", 6'4", Holloman 6'2". What's he talking about? Good question. What he's talking about is when he watches video and film of Illinois and he sees how big they are um, in the backcourt. You know, they, they've got Rodgers at 6'6", running the point now. <clears throat> so he sees that and he's having flashbacks to his northern Michigan days when he was a point guard undersized on the perimeter. And I can relate at a much lower level. So that's what he's talking about, and Illinois is going to be good. But it's interesting that just a week ago, Izzo was talking about the defense with Walker coming around and Aikens getting in, that he wanted to have the no-drive zone. He thought it could be the best, a great defensive backcourt, and it still could be. But horses for courses as they say, styles make fights. And Illinois has got size. And uh, Michigan State hasn't looked small in the backcourt, but they might look small in this game. Also, what he's talking about is he'd like to have one guy in the backcourt that is like Morris Peterson, Jason Richardson, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, and they don't have that. Michigan State's biggest backcourt guy is Aikens at like 6'4". So they don't really have a true small forward type of guy. They've got three guards. Uh, King Klom 45 says, have a great night, Comp. Thanks for the contributions. Thank you for the contributions. Steve Meyer says, hey, Jim, everything's looking a lot better now, holding firm in McKinney, Texas. Talking about the... It's like foggy here. We got some fog rolling in. That's what we're going to pretend all this... These technical difficulties are. John Elke says, the one and two, three spots are fine. It's the four and five where this team needs consistency. <clears throat> yeah. You know, Malik Hall, no no, uh, no secrets there. Played really well against Penn State. Who was the other one? Was it Indiana State? Played well there. Um, didn't have as many points against Indiana State, but played a really good role. Against Northwestern, you know, Malik Hall is Michigan State's best low post scorer while Kohler is out. Kohler's coming back now, but it's going to take him a while. And... Hall has gotten one or two buckets in the post. I don't want to say per game, but with some regularity. When he's played well, he's had one or two turnaround jumpers. Northwestern, like I wrote in the pre-snap read, is very good with double teams in the post. So they discouraged Michigan State from even throwing it down into the post. Because you throw it into the post, maybe you can get something else on the weak side, two passes later, but they're real good at double teaming and then scrambling and reacting out to it. So if you do attract the double team... It's just hard to make them pay. I don't want to make Illinois, I don't want to make Northwestern sound like the greatest defensive team, but Michigan State was discouraged from getting down low to, to Hall. And I'm not saying that's how Hall gets most of his points, but it's how he gets a couple of shots a game. Didn't even bother doing that. They did it once, and he tried to turn around jumper, remember, it hit the side of the backboard. So that part of Hall's game was eliminated. And Izzo said, today, maybe we didn't do enough to get him enough shots. He had four shots. Went to work a couple times with some face-up stuff. Um, but 
the consistency problem has been a problem for him since he's been a Spartan. He's had some good days. And he's even said, not this summer, but last year at Moneyball during the summer, he said, I want to establish some consistency. He said, I know I've not been the most consistent guy. So he's aware of it. He wants to do it. You know, I, I've not gone back to rewatch that game to just focus in on him to see what he was doing. Um, he's not a guy that's going to loaf. But he is a guy that'll get down on himself a little bit. And they guard against that and they try to keep his pillows fluffed and everything. But you're right. For this team to be good, he has to, he can't be vanishing like that. He's not as skilled as Hauser. He's not a guy that if he's wide open, it's, you know, a, a jump shot's like a layup to him. He's not that guy. He's been working on his shot, but it's, it's going to continue to be streaky, that part of it. As far as the five goes, Sissoko's been rebounding better. His ball screen defense has been good. Izzo did not like the way Michigan State was stepping up on ball screens or handoffs in the Northwestern game. I thought it was pretty good initially. I'd have to watch it again to see what the problem was. There's going to be a lot of handoffs, ball screens, DHOs against Illinois again. So Michigan State will have a chance to see if Sissoko can impact the game with his lateral movement, which is good with him. His defensive rebounds have been getting better. Offensive rebound, sporadic. Need more out of him in the offensive glass. Illinois has a couple of guys that do a good job going to the offensive glass. Going to need to box those guys out. Obviously, that's middle school basketball stuff, but early on in the Northwestern game, Michigan State, not great in those areas. You do that on the road again, you're going to be down by double digits again. Clark Marier checking in from Blustery, Sylvania, Ohio. Go green, says Clark Marier. Thank you. And remember to give us a like here at the channel and subscribe to the channel and get over to SpartanMag.com. Become a MAGA. We'd love to have you over there. Kevin Smith, KP Spartan. Greetings from Norman, Oklahoma. Old Tuck says, why is the Izzo coaching tree so mediocre? I'd take Chris Collins as his backfill over anybody on this. I would agree. James Bannon says, James Bannon in the house from Sterling Heights. Eric M says, checking in from Roswell, Georgia. Go green. Kenneth from Down River. I'll bet Kenneth know this, knows a thing or two about hockey. Down River is a big hockey thing, a hockey area, if you didn't know that. Westland. Is Westland Down River? Trenton. Woodhaven. Flat Rock. Wyandotte. All right. MSU Max is just showing off. Checking in from Jacksonville, Florida. Mike K says, who's got it better than MSU football and basketball? About everyone. So Mike K is, uh, he's a wise guy. Um, we'll see. His, uh, yeah. Austin Wolf says, go green. Go green from West Loop, Chicago. Doug Karen, John Blair from Marshall. All right, question number two. Alan from East Bay on Houghton Lake. That sounds good. I like winter months in the North Woods. Not had much winter this year, though. It was snowing this morning, and then it changed to rain around 3 o'clock. So I don't know if we're going to have a winter here this year. We had about 11 days of winter last year. And I'm getting tired of it. Because right now we're, we've got Ohio weather. And I, I, I've got no use for it. Houghton Lake, um, if there's any snow, it's going to be up there in the higher altitude of Gaylord. That's about 900 feet altitude and they do get more snow there. Houghton Lake. Around Grayling, Gaylord. There's some good cross-country skiing in there. I want to go check that out. Especially because I can't do it around here. So, Alan from the East Bay, let me know how the snow report is up there. Happy New Year, Jimmy says, with the coaching conference underway, that's the coaching convention underway in Nashville. He says, are you hearing anything regarding the final coaching slot on Coach Jonathan Smith's staff at Michigan State? Good question. Um, I kind of think it's going to be a linebackers coach, believe it or not. I'm thinking linebackers, who's also a co-special teams coach. Because uh, the coach they hired last week, Co uh, Coach Wilt, um, is a co-special teams guy. Which means there's going to be a second part to that co. 
Now you're saying, well, Rossi's already the linebackers coach. He's been hired as coordinator and linebackers coach, and that is true. But things can get jumbled and reshuffled. And it's my understanding Rossi is coaching the safeties right now and will be. So I don't think Rossi's doing that short term until someone else comes in. Maybe that's the case. I'll have to check into that a little bit more. I might be wrong about that, but that just occurs to me that, that maybe that's a short-term thing. So I want to get some clarification about on that. Anyway, forget I said any of that. Question four from the backup long snapper Detroit. He says, are there any portal wide receivers still in play? Are there any other portal offers likely to commit to the good guys? I was talking to Jason Killip about this. Michigan State is set at quarterback now, set at tight end, set at running back, set at safety, from what we gather, set at corner, now that they've got Tony Grimes. Still looking for another offensive lineman? Luke Newman from Holy Cross is going to be visiting January 18th. And looking for a linebacker. Wayne Matthews from Old Dominion could be that guy. And um, there'll be some slots opening you know, as you get into spring and post spring, as they see, as they take inventory of their roster moving forward, I would imagine there'll be some more coming and going during or after spring practice. But as of now, it's my understanding, a linebacker, an offensive lineman, and that's about it. Wide receivers, I'm hearing they're set there. <clears throat> well, let me let me double check here. Let me see. Let me check the wire real quick. Okay, wide receiver, um, still a possibility as well. That one's a little unclear. That one might wait till the spring. Question four, question five, Sola from Westland. He says, outside of Aiden Childs, who do you think will be the most impactful transfer on the roster in 2024 for the Spartans? All right, the transfers, let's go over them. You ready? Quarterback, Tommy Schuster, coming in from North Dakota. Quarterback, Aiden Childs, coming in from Oregon State. Offensive lineman, Tanner Miller, coming in from Oregon State. Wide receiver, TJ Sheffield, coming in from Purdue. Over 100 career receptions at Purdue. Tight end, Jake Jack Velling, Oregon State. Pac-12 tight end of the year. Defensive end, Quinn Dunnigan, Middle Tennessee State. Second team, all-conference, Conference USA. Defensive tackle, Daquan Douse of Georgia Tech. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Got to do some research on that. Linebacker, Jordan Turner, Wisconsin. Cornerback, just in the last couple days, Tony Grimes, Texas A&M, previously North Carolina. Those are your scholarship transfers at this point. Going to be some more. Probably the Matthews kid at linebacker. And we'll see what happens later in the spring. So this is a question we can revisit later. I'm guessing tight end Jack Velling. Tight end is a, is a, is a big part of every team's offense, almost every Big Ten team, but especially Lindgren and what they did at Oregon State. So Velling, as productive as he was last year, got to believe... He's going to be productive for the Spartans. So that would be my choice. Tanner Miller is going to be really interesting. What was he, third string, third team, all pack 12, former walk-on, gritty, hardworking guy. It's going to be his sixth year. He's only about 6'1". Mobile, square body guy, try hard guy, what you love. So he's important. He comes in. He will he knows what Halchick and the new offensive line and the new system. He'll be like a – he'll. I'm sure he'll be like a coach on the field. I'm sure they'll get along well. The culture on the offensive line has been good over the last few years in terms of guys getting along and helping one another. So he's going to be entering a room. They'll 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 welcome him just like they welcomed Brian Green when he transferred in from Washington State. Those were previous guys. Samak and Duplain, real nice guys. They've moved on, but that that culture, I have to believe, is still going to be in place. But Miller, over the course of time, can become a leader in there. Now, he's been a guard. He also started a couple of games at center for Oregon State, which is very interesting. Dallas Fincher played some center this year for Michigan State due to injury and was okay. Um, they're going to need better than okay at some point. 
can Fincher elevate his game? Or do they want to turn more over more of it over to Tanner Miller as a center? Considering he played some center at Oregon State. I suspect that might be the way they go. So what happens to Fincher? Fincher has played some guard. He can move out to guard and compete there. And if he's not good enough to start at any other position, then that's it's a meritocracy, right? So I think Jack Velling is the most impactful, but Tanner Miller potentially could have a big impact in different ways, valuable ways as well. Question six, DJ from Dublin, Ohio. He says, do you think there will be any punishments for Michigan this offseason? That's the question everybody's talking about today, and it's a question a lot of people are avoiding. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that there will be some punishment. There, There's obviously going to be some punishment. I just don't know if it's going to be as extensive as it should be or as, as, as extensive as everybody in the Big Ten would want it to be. I think pretty much everybody in the Big Ten. Um, the NCAA, they've got no precedent on something like this. And it's a it's an infraction that I think is not even going to be a rule in the future because soon, uh, I, I suspect, I would guess, that they're going to change to the NFL rule where coaches are going to be able to talk directly into the ear of the quarterback and the linebacker and signs in college football are going to go away. <clears throat> so <clears throat> do you really throw the book at somebody and even strip someone of a national title for a rule that won't be in existence? soon that's one thing now you know illegally having recruits on campus during covid and then kind of uh you know playing dumb about it to ncaa investigators did he did harbaugh flat out lie no i mean i wasn't there but you hear that he told the ncaa people that he didn't couldn't remember i mean that that worked okay for iran contra but you can't do that for uh Maybe you could do that for NCAA as well. Did that irritate people in the NCAA? Are there any people that are abrasive about it? They're like, you know, we're going to get that Harbaugh guy. Probably not. There might be some that are irritated by him. Most people that come into contact with him that he doesn't coach are irritated by him. So there's that. Now, in terms of precedent, there have been NCAA teams that have been stripped of national titles. Most famously in 2013, Louisville. And they were stripped of their national championship because the director of player operations organized parties that involved strippers and prostitutes, all kinds of unsavory activity. So the NCAA deemed those players retroactively ineligible, which means they played in the national championship game in, in, retroactively ineligible. So they, so that was stripped, no pun intended. Michigan doesn't really have that situation. It's not a deal where you're playing players that retroactively can be deemed ineligible. This was done by coaching staff members and aides and analysts and those type of people. Linebackers coach quit abruptly right when Michigan was reportedly getting ready to stand up with their heavyweight lawyers and law team to take on the Big Ten and force through their will that Jim Harbaugh was going to coach, by golly, against Ohio State. And then at the last minute, Michigan was like, okay, no, we're good. Now, the feeling is that the, that the Big Ten, through the NCAA, presented Michigan with some information and some hard evidence, at which point Michigan was like, okay, forget it, and they fired a guy. Now, Michigan people will still call it allegations. When you decide, I don't know, to me, when you decide not to go through with your big heavyweight law firm and legal action, to me, it's no longer allegations. To me, you've kind of acquiesced and said, okay, you got us. Am I wrong about that? So this talk about allegations of sign stealing. They're not allegations. So there's no precedent for sign stealing in these things. The, the sign stealing thing is going to be not part of, not even going to be a rule in the future because I think they're going to change that stuff. So players on campus during COVID and kind of lying about it, aggravated some people, sat out because of that. So now is, are, is he and is Michigan a repeat offender? Yes. Usually that make, makes for more of a punishment. Um, when you talk about others that have had National title stripped. In 1990, Syracuse had a national title in lacrosse stripped from them because the coach's wife 
um, co-signed for a car loan for a player. Now that's back when the NCAA was trying to like stamp out, you know, illegal inducements for players. Lacrosse national championship. Thirty-three years ago, what was punitive back then might not be as much now. North Carolina had a national championship in basketball. And the NCAA found that there were there was pretty much academic fraud, but they got away with it because NC, because North Carolina was able to prove, you know, these players that we have that didn't actually go to class and didn't have to really do any work. Well, we have other students here at the university that also go to class and don't do any work. So in terms of athletes getting preferential treatment, there is none because our regular students also, we have some that don't have to go to class and can get grades for not doing work which blew everybody's mind, but it was a loophole technicality. North Carolina got off. Kansas, the FBI probe, red-handed, won a national title. Did they even get a slap on the wrist? I don't know what they got. Bruce Weber, coach at Kansas State, was so upset about it that he grew his hair out long during his final season as a strike, as he got a haircut strike in protest of... The NCAA not coming down on Kansas. And he said he was going to let his hair keep growing until the NCAA did something, but instead he retired. Kind of got forced out, but that's another story. I think he was forced out. Good guy. Good for basketball. Kansas got away with it. North Carolina got away with it. Syracuse in another era didn't. Louisville, players retroactively ineligible, different situation. When I was watching Michigan this year, near the end of the season, to me, it, it's not the way it is, but I, I felt like I was watching SMU in the 1980s with Eric Dickerson and Craig James and that team that was bought and paid for. They were very good. Might have been the best team in the country. Might have been the best team in the country, but you watched them knowing that they weren't eligible for the national championship. Now, I think the UPI allowed them to get votes. There was one year when Auburn went undefeated, but everybody knew all year that they were on probation, could not compete for the national title. Of course, that's not the case with Michigan, but it should have been the case. Problem is, these transgressions happened during the season. Now, I don't know what the NCAA found. Um, I don't know what they have. We'll have to wait and see. Sign stealing is part of it. The Isaiah Bond in Alabama, the wide receiver who let slip during media day prior to the semifinal game, he talked about how at Alabama they weren't using laptops that week because of the, was it the catapult system or something like that. Basically, he let slip that Alabama was told, you know, we can't use our laptops because... Um, Michigan had hacked into laptops. That's the first time that that kind of went public. Behind the scenes, in the industry, um, I'm hearing that it's known that Michigan did hack into laptops. Been working on it. I don't know if it'll ever come out as a story. We'll see if NCA comes out with it or not. And there's also people hacking from that office that were fired for looking into other things on people's computers personal stuff so um not what i'm saying here shouldn't be seen as smearing anybody i mean they've they've had problems over there good football team just like smu in 1981 good football team like auburn that one year so the ncaa think about the ncaa right now ncaa is embattled they're losing control they're losing control of a lot of things With this situation, might they want to prove that they still have teeth and they still have power? Or are they so worried about going out of business and collapsing that they they don't want to poke one of their flagship institutions? I don't know. I don't know what the NCAA is thinking, but the NCAA, with whatever their long game plan is, is going to enter into this, I would think. So I don't know what's going to happen. But... Getting back to my point, what I, if, if the NCAA had all of this information, and yeah, you have, to, you have to do a lengthy investigation, which with NCAA used to take a year, now it takes four years. But if you have video evidence and hard evidence like this, I would think that you could have gone to Michigan right when this was breaking, you know, in late October, early November, late November, right around the time that they backed down from the legal attack to try to get was it an injunction or whatever to get Harbaugh to coach against Ohio State? You know, right when Michigan backed off on all that, if the NCAA could have said, listen, I, we realize that if we issue um, 
a penalty right now. Yes, you have 90 days to appeal. But we have all of this, X to Z, A to Z. And if you take this penalty right now, we, we want to make you ineligible for the postseason this year. Or if we do that and you fight it for 90 days, whatever penalty we come up with is going to be five times worse. Your decision. It's what the NCAA should have done. Because last night, that was a laughing stock. Very good football team. Very good football players. Well coached. But you can't be doing what they're doing during the season. And we only know part of it. And let that be your champion. It's just... It's uh, just my opinion. Am I biased? Yes. I'm biased toward dishonorable people. And they have a lot of dishonorable people over there. And that's the name of that tune. Question number seven, Spefton from East Lansing. He says, we have just a few positions left for portal talent. Oh, we've already been through that question. Question eight, Nick from Arlington, Virginia. He says, Jim, what is your favorite story that you wrote in 2023? What is your favorite story in 2023? For Michigan State's sake, it was Michigan State beating Marquette in the second round of the NCAA tournament in Columbus and advancing to the Sweet 16 for the 15th time in Tom Izzo's career. Very good Marquette team. Very good Marquette team. Um, what was the guy's name? XO Prosper? X Olivier? Whatever his name. The guy from Montreal. Great defensive player for, for Marquette. And was kind of underrated. I remember getting ready for watching that game. Or getting ready to write the pre-snap read prior to that. I think it was on Selection Sunday. I was telling Conan Dyke about it. How good Prosper was. And nobody was really talking much about Prosper. I'm like, that guy is a defensive shutdown four. And he was going to shut. He was going to do more. to. He had more capability to shut down Joey Hauser than anybody in Michigan State had played all year. And that was a reason that Marquette was good. They had him and a very good point guard. Shooters. All of it. Connecticut ended up winning the national title. Marquette beat Connecticut in the Big East tournament. Marquette was good enough to win the national title. Marquette probably would have beaten Kansas State. Michigan State had to play great to beat Marquette. Marquette, it was their bad luck that they drew Tom Izzo on a one-day prep in March. Marquette was good. Beating Marquette was a sizable accomplishment. And Izzo and his team was pretty pleased about that. They deserved to be. That was a happy story to write for Michigan State fans. Second best story I wrote this year, or happiest story or whatever, was Jonathan Smith being, getting hired at Michigan State. Really good hire, best guy available to Michigan State, and he wanted the job and he's attracted to it. Michigan State didn't have to talk him into it. He wanted to coach at Michigan State. Heard that earlier on, and you know to get him to come from his alma mater, he did a great job at Oregon State. They had a good team this year, a very good team last year. And um, that's credit to Michigan State to be able to, to attract him and get that one done. So that would have been the next best story. One and 1A. Some of you might say 1A was better. Question nine from Orange County, California. Jim, your thoughts on our new portal pickups. Have you watched any tape? Can you give us any breakdowns? Again, Schuster, quarterback, North Dakota. Childs, quarterback, Oregon State. Tanner Miller, Oregon State offensive lineman. You know the list. Did it earlier. I was watching Schuster today. Um, didn't know anything about that. So credit to Michigan State, keeping that one quiet. The guy was committed. Where was he committed? Oh, he wasn't committed. I got him mixed up with the Utah State guy. Schuster, fifth-year player at North Dakota. North Dakota's all-time leading receiver. Chippewa, Chippewa Valley High School, six feet, won a state title, Division One. That's in the northern, like, Macomb suburbs area. And I remember him. When they won a state title, they beat Belleville in either the semifinals or regional final. Little quarterback, stubby little dude, great accuracy. Great accuracy. Um, let me see my notes. On, on Schuster, you know, all time leading passer in North Dakota. Six feet, 195. They went 14-0 and 0 his senior year in high school. As a senior, 26 touchdown passes, one interception. And I remember when they won the state title, there was an article in the Detroit News talking about, you know, he had a good game and mentioning that he still had no Division I offers and ended up going to North Dakota. So it was kind of a curiosity. 
really good high school state champion type guy. And if you go back further and you look at some of his film, you know, you go to the, the rabbit hole of YouTube, you'll see film of him. I think it's the same Tommy Schuster, in like ninth grade on defense, just wrecking people. So I don't know if he grew to six feet and stayed there or what, but just a football guy. And, you know, legendarily, Bear Bryant used to say that he wanted on his roster all the state championship quarterbacks he could get. You're a quarterback, you want a state title, you're coming to Bama. We'll find a position for you, even if you're third string safety. You want a state title as a quarterback, you're on the team. Now, back then, you had unlimited scholarships, and he ran the entire state of Alabama, but Schuster's in that category. Ends up at North Dakota, ends up becoming their all-time leading passer. Now, accurate in high school, senior year, 70% completions. Had 36 starts in, in, in high school. Watched his high school film. He kind of had a long arm circle, kind of a long release. So I can see why Max schools didn't really see him as a quarterback. He's six feet. He has some quickness and some speed, but if you're going to be a six-foot quarterback, you're kind of hoping the guy can run around like Doug Flutie or Baker Mayfield or something. He doesn't quite have that kind of athletic ability and movement in the pocket. So he's he's short for the position, and he's got some movement, but not the greatest, but accurate. State championship game in high school against Clarkston. 13 of 13 through the air. First guy to ever do that, to go to not throw an incompletion, to throw nothing but completions in a state title game. Accurate, accurate. Very good touch on deep balls. Um, okay, so in, in the Missouri Valley Football Conference, he was honorable mention, all-conference of 2022, second team, all-Missouri Valley in 2020 during the COVID year, but was not all-conference or honorable mention this year. Senior year, they went 7-5, and five, and they beat North Dakota State. Cross-state cross rival, of course. Everybody knows what North Dakota State is. Perennial national champion contender at the FCS level. They beat them. I was looking at film of that today. I was going to roll it out here. And I said, no, I can't do that. That messes with the copyright. So like I said, maybe we'll do that somewhere else. You know, and not turn the monetization on and maybe do it over the Underground Bunker message board. But 2023, uh, through 19 touchdowns, only five interceptions, 70% completions, 208 of 294. So that accuracy carried over to college. They went 7-5, and five, pretty good team made the NCAA uh, FCS playoffs, and they lost in the round of 16, the first round of Sacramento State, back and forth. They lost something like 42-35. to 35. I watched highlights of that game today also. And uh, as a junior in 2022, 68%. As a sophomore in 2021, 65%. As a freshman in 2020 during the COVID year, 65%. So never below 65% in terms of accuracy. This year, 70%. As a junior... 2,700 yards, 20 touchdowns, five interceptions. Team went seven and five, honorable mention all conference. The year before, um, sophomore, 2,400 yards, 13 touchdowns, seven interceptions. Team went five and six. That's why he wasn't all conference that year. Team didn't do as well. 2020, during the COVID year, the team went five and two. Second team all conference, 1,400 yards. That's as a redshirt freshman, 10 touchdowns, five interceptions. His stats got better as he got older. Redshirted in 2019. He played in three games as a true freshman. So he goes there as a true freshman, six feet tall, gets on the field three games, redshirts. Starts the next three years. The next four years, four-year starter. Now he's got another year, which I don't understand because he played in 20. Oh, 20 didn't count. So redshirted in 19, 20 didn't count because it's COVID. Played in 21, 22, 23. He's got one more year. He's a sixth-year guy. He's a Michigander. I've not spoken with him yet, but I assume he always wanted to play at Michigan State, just like the walk-on punter Voss that they just got from Western Michigan from Dansville. So I don't know if he sold himself, got on the horn and said, hey, you need a quarterback. I don't know. I don't know what communication happened, but Michigan State needed a quarterback. And, you know, they lost all their quarterbacks, the portal, Noah Kim gone, Levitt gone, Hauser gone. Jonathan Smith says, you know, when, when he took over, they had no scholarship quarterbacks in the, in the program. That's unprecedented. That's unheard of. That's unbelievable. For the first time since World War II, there were no scholarship quarterbacks on campus. So they go out and they get Aiden Childs, of course, coming in from Oregon State, all kinds of talent, going to be a sophomore. So 
Any quarterback in the portal sees that, and they see, okay, Aiden Childs is their guy. Of course, no other transfer quarterback is going to be interested. So meanwhile, you have to have some backups. They'll get two, they get two, um, two uh, high school quarterbacks. Alessio Milivojevic from Illinois, previously tr- committed to Ball State. So you get a Ball State, you get a MAC flip. Then they go out west, get a Utah State flip from... Ryland, I forgot the guy's name, Ryland Jesse. And I got to watch Malloy. Malloy you know, neither one of those guys are perfect. I got to watch some more. I kind of like Malloy Vic a little bit better, but you got to have guys in the, in the room. And it, it'll depend on who can hit the curveball. You don't know who can, who can hit the curveball until you put him in the majors. For a college, for a quarterback, Curveball is reading coverages. You don't know who's going to be able to read coverages till, the, till they're presented with it at this level. So you got those two guys, but they're true freshmen. You don't really want a true freshman, have nothing but true freshmen for backups. I realize Oregon State had a true freshman last year in Childs, and then the guy that played in the bowl game. So they had backups to that. So ideally, if you're Michigan State, you'd love to have somebody come in with experience from the transfer portal, but beggars can't be choosers. You're not going to go out there and get you know the next Anthony Russo who you may remember came to Michigan State from Temple with 5,000 career passing yards to compete with Peyton Thorne, lost the job, Thorne stayed the starter. Those guys aren't going to be coming here because Childs is there. But this Michigander, Schuster, who set the passing record in North Dakota, probably always wondered if he could play in the Big Ten. Perfect situation. I'm not saying he's great, but he's got experience. State title, quarterback. Passing leader all time in North Dakota. He's got experience. He's going to see how good he is. He's going to give it a shot. That's, I mean, of course you'd rather have an Anthony Russo coming in, but this guy makes sense. And you, you're there. It's not a vast pool of talent that's available to you, but this guy's going to be a good story. Probably a very good teammate. I've watched some interviews with him. Um, good guy. Looks like. And he'll be fulfilling a dream, I would imagine. Putting on the green and white, coming out of the tunnel, fight song, all that stuff. It's good. And if Childs pulls a hamstring or something, he'll compete with the two high school guys. And I wouldn't be surprised if he wins that competition. Now, throws for a lot of yards. I've watched a good bit of his film. I've not watched complete games. I've watched condensed versions of the game against Boise State, highlights of Sacramento State, and highlights of them against North Dakota State including incompletions, interceptions, and ball security fumbles and problems. I've not seen a lot of the incompletions yet because they don't go into those type of highlights. I'm looking for full games. All right. Little guy and good touch on the deep ball, good touch intermediate. Not a guy that's got a rocket arm either. So he's short, he's not that athletic, and his arm is okay. Just saying it, Tommy. I love you, Tommy. I remember you in high school. Great. You're way more accomplished in football than I'll ever be at anything. So much respect. Um, I'm just relaying to the to the listeners and the readers what my thoughts about this are. Um, when I've watched North Dakota, a lot of the passes are screens, tear screens, tunnel screens, touch pass deep but not much to the wide side of the field. It's all, you know, this hashing over. Arm-wise, reminds me of Caton Hauser a little bit. Caton did not have the greatest arm. His mobility reminds me of Hauser a little bit. Has some mobility, not great mobility. His build is like Caton Hauser. He's like a shorter Caton Hauser. More accurate. Hauser might end up becoming very accurate someday, but... It's kind of who he reminds me of. He's like a six-foot Caton Hauser. So I don't know how that will all translate to this level if he has to play, but he helps fortify the roster a little bit so that, and you know, Shorefire is out there too. I assume Shorefire, Andrew Shorefire, the walk-on from DeWitt, I'm assuming he's still in the picture too. And Shorefire probably couldn't go in and win a game for you, but... I don't know, maybe if maybe, maybe he could. He's not going to pull one out, but if the run game is okay and the defense is okay, I think Shorefire could probably function. So 
Shorefire is going to compete with Schuster. Maybe Shorefire is better. I don't know. So that's what's going on there. I assume Shorefire is coming back. I'll have to reach out about that. We actually coached against his brother. Good baseball player, DeWitt. So you asked me about, the question was about if I've watched any film. So yes, I've watched film of Schuster. Childs, we've all seen his highlights. Arm for days. Just scratching the surface. I've not really di- dove into everything that he did. And Oregon State gave him, in some games, like the third series of every game. Not every single game. He was he had a lot of action against Stanford. They blew them out. I've not gone back and watched all the every snap and all the incompletions to everything. Gosh, it's January already. I've been planning to do that for a long time. I was planning to do that before Jonathan Smith was was hired. But we've got these things like hockey and basketball that we cover a little bit. And that women's basketball game last week when they played Iowa, that was entertaining as hell if you watched that. That was cool. And they beat Maryland tonight. Now, Maryland today, today Michigan State had six days off before this game or seven, whatever it was. And Maryland's a team that played like three games in four hours or something with the Big Ten did to them. Maryland, traditionally a very good team. Michigan State beat them tonight. Michigan State women. Robin Fralick hired by Alan Haller. Doing a really good job. Exciting brand of basketball. All those girls have improved. And they get after it. And and they um, they run some exciting stuff on offense. So that's going on. And recruiting's going on. And the portal's going on. So I haven't had a chance to go back and watch all the Oregon State stuff. Planning to. Tanner Miller, I watched him a little bit. I went back and watched and looked at his... his you couldn't find high school video of him. I went back and looked at at um, Oregon State's offensive lineman, like the guy that they have as a right tackle who's supposed to be an early round draft pick this year. And I looked at them, and then I went back and looked at their. I did this around signing day. I can't. I don't know where my notes are. And I wanted to look at th- those guys and what they looked like in high school. And the kid from Hawaii who's going to be a an early round draft pick. I called up his video and the first video I saw, I'm like, man, that guy's slow. And then I said, oh, that's his ninth grade film. Okay, my bad. Got to look at the date on these things. He had huddle film in there from like 2015. By the time he was a senior, he was better. But still, I wouldn't have looked at that guy and said, you know, future NFL guy, future all Pac-10 guy. They did. They developed it. They saw it. So I was curious about Tanner Miller. He's short. He's 6'1", offensive lineman, third team, all Pac-12 all right, what did this guy look like in high school? I went and looked for it, and I don't think I found any film. I think he's the guy that I flat out, there was no film. Sasquatch. Bigfoot. No film. So, but Miller watching them, I mean, he's got mobility. He's like a better version of Travis Jackson. Remember Travis Jackson, center for Michigan State, Rose Bowl? I'd say similar to that. A little better. Nothing against that. Nothing against you, Travis. Much respect. Travis Jackson... Since Nanny St. Xavier, I think. One time, I think my I think my daughter was in first grade then. She came home. Dad, do you know Travis Jackson? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And she goes, He read to our class today. That's cool. So Travis Jackson, much respect. The yes, yes, yes guy. That's my guy. But Tanner Miller might be a little better than you, Travis. No disrespect. TJ Sheffield, we've seen him at Purdue over the years. Good. Over 100 catches. Um, Maybe a slot guy, I don't know. But good, solid, functional, proven Big Ten wide receiver. That's a nice get out of the portal. Because I don't know who else was after him. There's more of a story there also. How did, did, you know, how much did Courtney Hawkins have to do with that? Obviously a lot. That's a really interesting one. I wouldn't have pegged Michigan State to have the recruiting pull and strength to go to Purdue and get that guy, but they did. It's good. You know, I've not watched Quinn Dunnigan yet. I've not watched the kid from Georgia Tech yet. I've not watched Jordan Turner yet. I've seen him play, but I've not studied him. The pre-snap read, 2022, I looked at him a little bit. Solid, you know, inside linebacker type. Tony Grimes at North Carolina, watched him a little bit. Former five-star recruit. He's ranked number 19 player in the country. Goes to North Carolina, started three games as a freshman, true freshman, started as a sophomore, started as a junior, was okay. Um, I watched some film, and, you know, 
Needs to be a little more fluid. Looks like Tarzan. I mean, eye test for days. Strong. A little bit like Ronald Williams, I guess. Remember the guy at the corner that transferred from Alabama? Looks good. He's thicker than Ronald Williams. There's one play when he's playing press coverage against Miami. Three minutes to go. Press coverage. And gives up an inside release, which I would, I would think usually you'd want to take the inside away, but he gives it up, but turns his hips really quick and catches up and makes a pass break up in the end zone. Other games when, you know, it's his highlight tape, he's kind of getting beat a few times and little, um, has some stuff to work on. Was a highly ranked recruit going to North Carolina, started for a couple years, went in the portal, A&M got him, Texas A&M. He was injured last year. So former five-star, you know, you know, don't expect him to be Darquez Denard. Will he compete for a starting job? Yes. Looks good. You know, breaking down to tackle. He kind of breaks down. Not real, you know, needs to work on being more. Maybe they teach it that way in North Carolina. I don't know. But I know Mike Tressel used to be. I don't want you breaking down to tackle. I want you going through it to make a tackle. Does he have the fluidity to, to do that? I don't know. Good guy to put into the talent pool. Michigan State got him. They liked Hurd a lot too. But Hurd's looking at what? Michigan and Notre Dame. The the kid from Farmington transfer from North Northwestern. So Grimes, solid addition. Um, has some work to do, and they'll they'll be working with him. Blue, Coach Blue, and those guys will be getting after him. We'll see what he becomes. So I've watched some film, but not all of them, and I need to watch more. Let's go back over here to the comments area. I don't think anybody is. Uh, Stepping out of line. looks. I think Noah Sprunger's here. Noah Sprunger does such a great job for us. Really appreciate him. Appreciate Paul Conadyke. Hope Paul's feeling good. Talked to him a couple days ago. He was he was battling some health situations, you know, seasonal stuff, and so to speak. So I'm hoping he's doing all right. Jason Killip's doing great with his coverage of the transfer portal and recruiting. Jason Killip doing a great job. I love the interview with Jason Killip with Andy Staples and the On3 Network was tremendous. And everybody, Jake Laskawa, great intern, doing such a great job. All those guys, appreciate all of them. And all the Spartan Maggers for making it all possible. People that subscribe, help us pay the bills. Thank you for that. So, let's see whatever, what else we have. I'm going over here to the comments area. Tanner, what's that? Um, LFG says this Tanner Miller is a transformational player ad. Will solidify the 24-25 offensive line. Um, the current coaches know him way better than I do, obviously. And I suspect they're very excited to have him. So I think you're right. You make a good point. I would imagine that be the case. J.J. McKay from the Keweenaw uh, way up north says, that's what I'm saying. Watched a bunch of video on him last night. Very impressive. I don't know who you're talking about. Maybe Tanner Miller. I'm talking about Silas, the wide receiver. Um, that one is still... Or Silas. Yeah, I, I'm... Let me, let me check my... Let me check the wire on... Let me check what Jason said on that one. Um, Silas Bolden tells Jason he will visit Michigan State, but he has scheduled trips to Texas, Arizona. And he says Washington, Texas also. So that's going to be a tough one. So, yeah, Silas Bolden, the slot receiver from Oregon State, um, really sought after. So we'll see what happens with that one. Andrew Stoddard says, I think Nick Marsh will play a lot. I had some Nick Marsh video loaded in here. I think I deleted it. That was stupid. JJ McKay says, we don't need him, but he would be a great addition. Talking about Silas Bolden. Mark Webster says, wide, re wide receiver depth is solid. It's just a guy like that is a major plus. Um... 
Mark Webster says, high hopes for Glover and Foster playing better ball. Both flashed at times. I would agree with that. And I look forward to seeing what they do in this system. I heard that Glover and some others, as they studied Oregon State video, they they liked it. Now, Oregon State was heavy with the run under center, but they took shots, and I heard that that was impressive to them. They wanted to be a part of it. Baird's bike video says Michigan had some big time holding to help them run the ball that the referees let them do. I would agree with that. There were three or four non-calls and holding that really helped Michigan. I'm sure there were others on other parts of the field, but glaring, you know, keeping a lid on Odunze a couple of times, a big time running play that you're talking about that the cameras picked up and Herb Street didn't mention, but you saw it. And then potential game-changing play when he went deep to Ndudze for 40 yards, called holding, 50-yard change, punting after that. It, it, it uh, stalled a um, one of many drives for Washington that were stalled. Hey, Michigan was the better team, but, you know, they're, Michigan from top to bottom complains about officiating more than, more than Bobby the Brain Heenan. So... Um, if it had been the other way, can you imagine the whining and crying? But this time, worked for them. And they had to have seen it, too. And they were the better team. But Washington was teetering on really getting back in that game and, and getting in position to sneak that thing out of there. And if those, if the officials had done their job at a national championship well, at a national championship rate, level, in each of those instances, that game would have been closer going to the last 10 minutes. Now, the hold... Herb Street didn't seem to like that hold, the one that was called, the call that brought the play back. But if you call that, you have to call the other ones, and that's football, I guess. But it's the way it is. J.J. McKay says, another offseason working with Hawkins should help Foster and Glover. Let me zip through these here real quickly, then I'll get back to um, the rest of them. We'll try to get out of here and get, let you guys... Uh, Get out to your cars and, and, and drive home safely. Yeah, okay. Mark Webster says it's the key setting for the green screen. It must have a setting. Grain is often a result of low light or shadows. Yeah, you're right. I haven't tried that since you know I've got I've got a new laptop. So let me see here. I've got green screen in. And I don't know what the settings. I'll have to work with that. I'm not seeing anything that would change that. Here's manual focus. Let's see what happens here. Wait, is that moving? Use manual focus. I'm probably going to be look out, look out, look out. That's not, I look better like this for sure. Like that, in case you weren't looking. Yeah. All right, I'll just have to mess with that some other time. Sorry we, we ran that, but appreciate Mark uh, offering the, those tips. Right now, just kind of looking like snow. That's why I left it on the night setting. But I am angry about that. And I just caught that like 10 minutes before we went on the air. I'm bothered by it. James Post from Fargo, originally from Higgins Lake. Noah Sprunger, great to have Noah here. LFG with some good support. Appreciate that. Yeah, the production value is a problem. We're kind of a punk version of sports media. Stripped down and distorted. With some unsavory attitude sometimes. Are right, you guys are still talking about Bolden. J.J. McKay, good to have your support from up in the Keweenaw. Spartan MD says he loves Jim Cappuccino. Cappuccino would have been a cool last name. There was a guy with a last name, Cappuccino. Do you remember him? I'll give you guys five seconds to remember it. If you're a sports fan from the 90s, you might remember, but it's obscure.
Tuesday night fights, USA Today, and the referee tonight, Frank Cappuccino. He was a boxing referee. Remember Larry Hazard, Richard Steele, Mills Lane, Frank Cappuccino? Who were some of the other ones back then? Carlos Padilla? He was a referee for the Thrilla in Manila, right? Or am I thinking of the wrong guy? All right. Anyway, I just had a boxing brainstorm from back there. Jimmy Coffee. Used to be. I kicked the habit. But I used to like coffee a lot. Coffee used to make the world a better place. But, um, started bothering me. All right. I promised to look up Higgins Lake. You better do that. Spartan MD loved the small Northwestern arena. Doors fan 91 says, low cop. What do we have here? West Branch, round where up north starts, if I recall. Toward Grayling, maybe. I'll look. LFG doesn't seems to be interested in Michigan geography, but doesn't have a great handle on it. But you're right. In my estimation, West Branch is where up north begins on the eastern side of the state. West Branch, Pinconning, Clare, Pentwater, right across, right across here. Because that's where the... That's where the trees change. That's where the trees start getting some birch in here. Starting to get more pines in here. And you start getting those black spruce and jack pines that you don't get. They don't grow down here. They grow there. The, the forest change. So the boreal forest is right there. So the true north woods are. Andrew Stoddard says, but I think the true up north for me starts at the Zilwaukee Bridge. Zilwaukee Bridge right there just north of Saginaw, right? On I-75. Just beyond that, I think a little, uh, I'll, I respect that, but I think it's a little bit beyond that. West Branch on I-75, or if you're on 23, Pinconning. Things get, not only do, does the, do the trees change, but also things like the gas stations change. You start getting more jerky, and you get more like knotty pine interior at the McDonald's. Not that gas stations at McDonald's have a big impact on things, but Zilwaukee, it's still Saginaw. It's still a little industrial, nothing against in industry. Great respect for the auto industry and everything around that in the great state of Michigan. Zilwaukee, I think one time I went over to the Zilwaukee Bridge for a hockey tournament in the dead of winter. There are a lot of people ice fishing out there. Is that the Saginaw River? Yeah, Saginaw River, right? And I'm like, that's cool. I hope there's ice fishing this year. I don't know if we're ever going to have a winter. I don't know if we're ever going to have a winter. Zilwaukee Bridge. LFG says, Sissoko is frustrating. He reminds me of a young Balo. Wish he were more assertive on offense. Hope springs eternal. LFG, I like your attitude. You're not shutting the door on it. Balo and Sissoko are both from Mali. Pretty sure. Both from the same country. And they are similar. And Balo is similarly inconsistent. Sissoko's working on the offense. The free throws are looking better. He, you know, the rhythm and the feel of a turnaround jumper hook shot, it's not there yet. It could click at some point. But in today's basketball, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, there might have been use for him professionally, maybe. But he's only 6'9". He's not like a true seven-footer or anything. But, you know, he's a team-oriented guy. He wants to help. He's improved his body. He's put in the work. He's intelligent. You know, the ball screen defense, he's got a handle on that. The lateral movement is good with the with the with with the length. So that's useful. Just the ball screen defense will get you on the court. Defensive rebounding's been good lately. It's got to be good every single night. They're impressing that upon him. Like I said in the VCAS last week, you think, you know, you, you, people get focused on everything Mari Sissoko is not, but you need to appreciate what he is rebounding coming around ball screen defense post defense pretty good i'm not saying he's going to shut down zach Eady in the low post no one in the country can do that 
but good enough. And the value to Mati Sissoko would be knock on wood if you had to go without him. You don't realize what he is until he's not there. If he weren't there, it's like you're trying to do the dishes and somebody takes the drain out and all the water runs out. He's like a drain stop. He's important. So appreciate what he is. But there is more there. I don't shut the door on the possibility of him becoming a functional offensive player at some point. I thought maybe this year it could, but it might not ever happen. But it could happen. That release, is, you know, if, if someone can shoot 90% from the free, free throw line, they can become a good face up shooter. He's not 90% yet, but the rotation looks good. He's picked that up pretty good. Turnaround jumper, there's a rhythm to it. Remember Dewan Wiley? He had a real good low post game. He's a junior college transfer early in Izzo's career. He was part of that Mateen Cleaves recruiting class, goes back that long. Junior college guy played two years, played a little bit as a first year Juco guy. As a senior, I think he started, but they would low post feed him the start of every half, James Edwards style. And he had a real nice turnaround jumper, shot about 70%. For that, had a feel for it. I don't close the door on the possibility of Sissoko developing something like that. Andrew Stoddard chiming in about White Lake Waterford hockey. Andrew Stoddard, what what makes you mention that? White Lake Waterford hockey. Sounds like you've been into Lakeland Ice Arena a few times on M59. Right next to Atlas Supermarket, if it's still there. There's a Burger King right there. What else is there? Lakeland Ice Arena, been there many times. My kid played there. I skated there as a youngster. I grew up about 10 minutes from there. Anyway, White Lake, Michigan. 4501 White Lake Road. All right. Spartan MD checking in from West Bloomfield. Stoddard hanging strong with Zilwaukee. Anywhere north of Niles is north, laughing out loud. Speaking of Niles, Michigan State. One of the uh, recruits, which one was it? One of the recruits from Hawaii. Was it Rustin Young, I think? It was either Rustin Young or Kiki Burnett. One of those two, they were Oregon State commitments, signed with Michigan State in December. Um... One of them has an aunt who lives in Niles. And during the recruitment, it was expressed to them after, you know, some of the coaches were, you know, they, they have to be clued in on these things because they don't know locally what a lot of the people around here know, that there's Amtrak service every single day from East Lansing to Niles. So he's cutting this player, whether it was Burnett or Young, coming all the way from Hawaii there's going to be some homesickness there, right? So having a chance to get on a train, two hours, it's about $40 round trip, I think, $50 round trip, to Niles, you go see your aunt in two hours. Actually, the aunt lived in South Bend, but South Bend is 10 minutes from Niles. Anyway, you mentioned you're from you, anything. You mentioned Niles a minute ago, and that's what comes up. Andrew, we lived in Highland, not far from old Duck Lake Elementary. Highland. Do they still have the high white Little League? That's where I played way back in the 70s by M59. Highland, was it Highland Elementary? You can see it on M59 still. I had some good moments out there and some bad moments. I remember striking out all star. You know, back then the the twelve U year. You know, that's the you know the the little league and the, you know, you have your all stars and they have their playdowns for the little league world series, because there's no travel baseball back then. We were in districts, then you win the districts, and that that's how they you know, not that we were going to make a run or anything, but I made the last out striking out against Howell, on that field. And you know what? When I drive by there, I look at those trees where I stood after that game. I still remember that. So Highland, we're getting some Highland trivia here. Duck Lake, Duck Lake Elementary. We played 
We didn't have T-ball. The coaches pitched, but Duck Lake Elementary is where we played, you know, six and under. I remember riding my bike out there or the car, just the dirt roads, northern Oakland County. Tremendous, tremendous potholes on those dirt roads out there at Duck Lake Road. That was bike riding distance from my house. Anyway, so you lived in Highland. Been over to the Highland house, I would imagine. I think the Risons still run that one. FDC says, curious what you think about Joe Rossi and how his scheme will fit MSU. Hey, I tell you what, and I wrote about this on the Underground Bunker. The pre-snap read is something that we write at SpartanMag.com where I take a deep dive into the coming opponent. And we post it on Friday afternoon. Try to be afternoon, sometimes 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, sometimes 8 o'clock. If I'm, but it's, it's, it's labor-intensive and it's in-depth. It's comprehensive. We aim to be informative. It's called the pre-snap read. It's required readings for all self-respecting Michigan State football fans. And I remember diving deep into to Minnesota before the 2022 game. And you might remember Michigan State was a top 10 team in 2021, came back preseason top 20, even top 15 in 2022, won a couple of games, went out and played Washington. And before that game, I said, hey, the Michael Penix that you remember from Indiana is way better. Believe it. And then Michael Penix, around that time, started doing Michael Penix things for two seasons. I warned you, the next week they're playing Minnesota and I'm watching their defense. And I mentioned this before in the, the V-Cast and other times. And at the tailgates that day before the game, I'm like, man, Minnesota's going to kill Michigan State today. People are like, no. Nah. I'm like, dude, Michigan State was 2-1 and one in the top 25. Wrote the pre-snap read and it was not optimistic. And when I write a pre-snap read that is not optimistic for the home team, I get attacked by Michigan State fans. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to just tell you every time that Michigan State's going to win? No problem. I'm like, Minnesota's got their crap together. I sat down in the press box and I said to Paul Konerdijk before kickoff, I said, I would trade Michigan State's staff for Minnesota staff right now. Now, I realize that P.J. Fleck has had some ups and downs since then, but I said that to him. Before the game. Did I put that in the pre-snap read? No. Because I thought that. And I believed it. But. There's some things that if you throw out there. You end up hanging yourself. Because sometimes things might just seem so outlandish. But the defense. I wrote in the pre-snap read that Minnesota was like Iowa light. And that's a big compliment. Because I have great respect for Iowa's defense. Everybody does. Iowa's defense, they hit hard. They know where to be. They've got their crap together. Minnesota 22, 2022, they hit hard. They knew where to be. They had their crap together. Now, they didn't play, and they played a lot of zone. And you go back and watch them now, cover two, cover four, and cover six, both together. And um, some quarters, zone. They had a real good middle linebacker, number 55. I think his name was Mariano. And I reached out to him after Michigan State hired Rossi. I reached out to Mariano to see if he would do an interview just to talk about Rossi because he had graduated from Minnesota. He said, no, I can't because I didn't realize it, but Mariano was like a GA for Minnesota. He couldn't, so he had to decline. Understandable. But really respect. And when I heard, I really was impressed with Minnesota's defense that year. The safeties, the middle linebacker, playing 11 men, playing with one brain. They had some specialists, you know, pass rushers and stuff. And they, you know, statistically, they ranked among the best in the country in scoring defense and these type of things. Scoring defense was a little bit a little bit misleading because they played at a pace that was conducive to keeping scores down. But the rest of it, there's no mistake. And it's not like they're recruiting four-star guys across the board. They're doing it in a, in a very resourceful way. Evaluation at the high school level and then player development from there. This year, in 2023, they'd graduated that middle linebacker, and they had other, a lot of youth, and the defense went south on them, which happens. And especially if you're at a place that can't just reload with recruits every year. But when he had his guys and he had some experience, the defense was, was good. Now, I'm not saying they're going to shut everybody down. There's not any defense that shuts everybody down. You know, I mean, what Alabama gave up, 28 points five times this year, something like that. So if you swim, you're going to get wet. If you swim, you're going to get wet. If you're coaching defense, you will play teams 
that will have success on you at some point. There is no defense that shuts everybody down every single week. Some Alabama teams in recent years here and there with nothing but five stars. But Rossi, when I heard Michigan State was interested in him and he was going to be the guy, I'm like, hell yes, I remember that guy. That makes perfect sense. So that's the way to think about him. Someone asking about Max Bullock? No, because I don't think he has any any um, special teams experience per se, but he's a good young coach and he's out there. Would not be surprised if he coaches here someday. Andrew Stoddard uh, at LFG. I'm about two miles south of the Mire in White Lake, right by Lakeland High School. Yeah. My last basketball game as a junior was at Lakeland High School. Lost in the tournament. Yeah, give us a like and subscribe to the channel and consider becoming a magger. We'd love to have you over there. Am I talking too long about this? I'm going over the comments too much. Um, the Grimes thing, confirmation. I don't know if we do or not. Brian Bowes. J.J. McKay says, yeah, not much snowmobile tourism like usual up here. LFG says, I would have attended Lakeland but moved to Heartland. I was right on the Lakeland-Holly border. I'm giving too much information now. Michigan State women's basketball team is a good team. My nephew plays for East Lansing High School basketball. They are ranked number one in the state through week six. I didn't know that, J.J. McKay. I went and watched East Lansing last week against Grand Blank. I watched K.J. Torbert, 10th grader, and Cam Hudson, junior. Hudson's about 6'6 six, six and a half, 11th grader. Torbert's about 6 feet, 6'1, six, 6'2 six, maybe. That's Kelvin Torbert's son. Hudson is Andre Hudson's son. Good team. Torbert's thin. He's not thick like his dad. Jumps well. Um, shot is pretty good. He plays the wing. He's got a point guard body, but they've got a pretty good point guard right now. I'll be interested to see if he becomes a point guard in the future. Michigan State's not offered either of them, but they've watched them, and they're watching them. Hudson is a wing. If he keeps growing, could become like a stretch four, mismatch four, but not big enough to be an all-purpose four necessarily. Is he athletic enough to be a true wing? Maybe his lateral movement looked good on defense. Handles the ball pretty good. So Michigan State's looking at them. Hudson right now is kind of getting Mac interest. Miami of Ohio watched both of them. And there's another junior, Lawson or something like that, athletic, threw in a really impressive athletic dunk. Junior. Miami of Ohio was watching them at practice last week, watching all three of them. The Hudson kid is, a, is emerging as a Mac guy right now, at the least. Insiders say they wouldn't be surprised if he starts getting some Atlantic 10 interest. And Michigan State's watching. So we'll see what happens this summer. But J.J. McKay, your, your nephew, plays for East Lansing. Very cool. Andrew Stoddard says, Small world, I lived in Heartland until second grade. Went to Lakes Elementary. Moved to Rochester after that. But pretty much lived my entire life along M59. Mm-hmm. All right, Kelvin Torbert's son is playing on the team. That's right, just got into that. J.J. McKay says, Velling is a huge upgrade from Malik Carr. Malik Carr, of course, transferred to Houston this week. Carr has his detractors, including detractors on the previous coaching staff. A lot of talent. I got to know him pretty good. I like him. I root for him. He's an intelligent kid, but he needs to make sure that he's his own proponent instead of his own opponent. And... Yeah, I'm not surprised that they didn't really invite him back. And he made it known on social media that he kind of wanted to come back. But I kind of understand both. I understand why he wanted to come back. And I kind of understand why they're like making room for kind of some, some new oxygen. So I hope he uh, gets a handle on things and does well at Houston. But um, he's, got a, he's got talent. So if they get it squared away down there, he might do well. Uh, 
FDC says, do you see Andrew DePape and or Stanton Ramil being impactful this year? Cheers from Connecticut. Thank you, FDC. Um, DePape has a lot of ability. I liked his senior film a lot. Junior film, four star and deservedly so in terms of his ability. He's a guy that needs to, you know, the accountability needs to be good. Toe in the line needs to be good. Needs to really make sure he's doing all the right things to live, to adhere to the low ego, high output mantra. He has horsepower. He has ability. But he's got to toe the line. So we'll see. Got on the field for one game this year in mop-up duty. He has ability. Uh, do I see it? I'm not expecting it. I'm not counting on it. Would not shock me. Um, well, we'll learn more in the spring. It was kind of hard to get updates on player development. It's been that way since COVID, really. During the D'Antonio years, and I would like to recommend this, but it's, it's hard. But during the D'Antonio years, when we had interviews on Tuesdays after practice, we would do interviews in the indoor football building. You may remember Conan Dyke and I used to do the V-Cast from inside the building and a lot of the inside the, the indoor practice field on Tuesdays. And we used to do interviews there after practice, like four or five o'clock at night. And the players would be in the indoors. Some of you that have been Spartan Mag subscribers for a long time may remember that. So when those interviews would go on, we would, you know, those of us in the press corps, we would, you know, we would give some of our requests as to who we would like to speak with after practice. Sometimes we would get those players. Sometimes we wouldn't. Sometimes they would have other players come in and we got what we got. And there might be one or two coaches available. Okay, we do that. And then during interviews and so forth, maybe after the coach interview was done, I might get a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with that coach off camera. Or maybe I'd see another coach coming walking off the field and I might just ask something about a play from the previous game just to get a better understanding on things so that I can relay to the fans um, what went on, what was really going on, what was supposed to happen. And, and though, just to have better insight rather than just guessing all the time. You don't want to be guessing. At least I don't. And, and the paying subscribers trying to owe it to, and trying to provide them with something. So in those days, I was able to talk to coaches and ask about third stringers that are on the scout team or that type of thing to get insight on how, who's coming along. And I wouldn't ask about every single player. I would just say, say, hey, so who's looking good with the young guys? And they'd say, and they'd give you a name. Now, if you ask about every single guy, they're going to say something good about every single guy. So I'd rather that they tell me a player that's more organic. So at some point, might ask a little bit about this and that. Um, anyway, COVID hit, and then the new building, and now the interviews are over in the the Izzo Media Center and in the northern tunnel of the stadium. We don't do interviews at the indoor building anymore. Tucker had practice in the morning instead of at afternoon. So a lot of those things changed. And the one-on-one, -on -one, off-the-cuff, casual interview here and there with coaches, don't get that anymore. So I've got to try to uh, become more resourceful and trying to get some of those things. Not that I'm trying to uncover some huge scoops, but I'd like to know more about Andrew DePape and some of these people. And that's uh, so um, didn't get on the field, did not travel to the Penn State game. Neither did by Job. Don't know why. Um, so there's that. Baird's Bikes video says Nick Marsh will be freshman of the year. Tanner Miller, really crucial, most underrated, says LFG. All right. Andrew Stoddard, Stoddard saying he uh, grew up swimming at the pool by four cousins over there on Adams Road where Madonna grew up, where she went to school. She went to, she's from Royal Oak, wasn't she? Adams Road, Madonna. You know, Madonna, time for her to, to hang up the glove. Um, 
This is the Great Respect Show. I get great respect for Madonna, believe it or not. I like Madonna. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie about it. I liked her back in the old days. Still do. Madonna Saccone from Royal Oak. All right, let me get back here. I could go into these comments a lot. Um, John Blair says, the future of the NCA is in the balance. He says, I disagree, comp. The future of the NCA is in the balance. There will be show cause for several coaches and a postseason ban. Just a hunch. Possible gambling issues. Don't piss off Vegas. Well stated, and I respect your opinion. You might be right. Postseason ban next year, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Can you imagine them handling that? Can you imagine? Yeah, postseason ban next year, I could see that. But in terms of stripping this championship, that's what a lot of people want. But they never should have been playing in it. All right. Spartan MD says it's not the point that they cheat, which they do. It's the hypocrisy. Also, you know, and I posted this on the bunker last night. You can talk about, you know, you hear a lot of this stuff like, hey, we're Michigan. We're still good. See, we didn't need to cheat and we still won the national championship. Yes, you did. That's good. And, I, and probably Craig James and Dickerson and SMU would have won one also. But there was a different kind of cheating for them that, that helped put them, their team together. Here's the thing. Correct. You're not cheating anymore. Correct. You're clean now for right now. You're not doing anything illegal right now. Well, neither is Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein is not raping anybody anymore. And I use that term because that's what he was convicted of. He's not doing anything illegal now, but he's paying the price for what he did. And he still is. And they should too. So all this stuff about like, well, we're not doing it anymore and we still won. It's not the point. You did it. Um, MSU Hunter Spartan checking in from snowy Wisconsin. Well, that's encouraging. That's encouraging. Snow in Wisconsin. Got some comments about the Michigan thing here. What happened here? Uh... Trevor Thompson says, Jim, do we know what Matt Weiss did when he hacked into computers? Um, yeah, that's known, but it's not for public consumption. He was the guy that was... I don't know if he was the... the there were two of them, right? J.J. McKay says, Harbaugh was on the verge of being fired before the cheating started. That is true. All right, let's go back over here to the uh, the mailbag. All right, Sam from Birmingham, Michigan says, with all the changes through the portal and the new recruits, it seems like the football team, this is a good question here. So I, I, this one took some time. This is why I was late. My neck's a little sore. Sorry about that. All right, Sam from Birmingham, Michigan. That's my Bob Seger voice. From Birmingham, Michigan. Guys know what Live Bullet is? Do people still know what that is? I usually do it better than that, but I failed twice. I'm not going to try it a third time. From Birmingham, Michigan, he says, with all the changes through the portal and the new recruits, it seems like the football team has made improvements from an overall talent standpoint. That's what he says. He says, do you agree with that statement? He says, I'm encouraged by the offensive line talent and hope that it can start being a team strength again. What position group are you most concerned with from a talent standpoint? All right. Um, I forgot. I don't know if I got to that part about which, which one am I most concerned about. Remind me about that one. All right. Let's go position by position, whether the talent is up or down. Sanford Birmingham says, it seems to me like the football team has made improvements from an overall talent standpoint. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Running back. Yes, talent is up. They got everybody back, and they add 
two guys, but I'm really excited about Maki Frazier. I think he's a one-cut power guy, perfect for the Oregon State system, which is now the Michigan State system. I think he's a tough dude, tough running back coming out of Texas. He adds to it. Now, is everybody coming back? Berger and everybody? I know We know that Mangum is. Nathan Carter's excited about coming back. Now, they lost Jordan Simmons, but he doesn't really count. No, no disrespect, but he's not part of the talent pool. So you got everybody coming back, and Frazier's added to it, so running back talent is up. I probably need a... I need a sound effect for that. So running back talent is up. Running back talent is up. Tight end. Tight end talent. You lose Malik Carr, who is talented, but, you know, you hear things about some oxygen, to use a term. He's just not, you know, his own coaches sparred with him and battled with him. Missed a couple of games for an injury, reportedly. Um... Intelligent guy, a lot of talent. I wish him the best. Turned on that talent a few times, catching the ball. Made made some really good catches and some run after the catch, some really good plays. Not always the most reliable in terms of blocking and running the correct route and things like that. Not always the most accountable in terms of preparation during the course of the week. Izzo, to quote an all-time great, always says, your best players need to be your hardest workers. Carr was one of their best players. Hard work and all the other things. If some of your best players, and it's not a great example, it's not great. So hopefully he can capture that in the future for him at Houston. But when you're a new coach coming in and you're trying to get things straightened out, you got to pull some weeds. Sometimes you want to infuse your own oxygen. So a lot of talent there, but you bring in Jake Velling. Jake Velling might not be as talented as Carr. But he's got good ball, body control, good hands. Pack 10, pack 12, tight end of the year. Carr, I mean, who knows? Five years from now, Carr might be in the league and Velling might not be. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. But Velling, as a college football player right now, is an upgrade there. Now, Michigan State also lost Evan Morris. He was functional, former walk-on kickoff specialist. A lot of respect for him. This is the great respect episode of Spartan Mag Live. Much respect, Evan Morris. But, you know, somewhat functional. But the fact that Michigan State had to use him tells you where player development was and evaluation, recruiting. I don't know. But tight ends just never got any momentum going at that position during the Tucker era. They recruited some, and some looked pretty good. But I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if you see a major jump from some of those guys. We're going to find out. To quote my, to quote Pat, Mardu- Pat Narduzzi, one of Pat Narduzzi's great repeat quotes, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Well, tight end, we're going to find out. I think Parachek's looking good. We haven't seen Nickel or Masunas get on the field at all, maybe for a play or two. I think Nickel looks functional when I've seen him in spring game and things like that. I don't know why he wasn't on the field. I don't know. I don't close the door on him becoming pretty good someday, maybe soon. I don't know. Wozniak's a good, good tight ends coach. They got so much out of their tight ends at, tight ends at Oregon State. So that position is in it, the best hands it's been in at Michigan State in a long time. So, Velling, and then you sign Wyatt Hook, who I think is the most underrated part of the player in this recruiting class. California kid, athletic, body control, hands, got a frame to build on. Wyatt Hook's going to be good in the future. I'm not saying he's going to be good right away. But talent, you lose Carr, who's very talented. You bring in Velling, who's very accomplished. Tight end, talent up. (laughs) Running back up, tight end up. Wide receiver. You lose Christian Fitzpatrick. You lose Terrell Henry to Wisconsin. Fitzpatrick goes to Marshall. Fitzpatrick was the one wide receiver that had some size, and with that came some potential. But accountability was not great with him either. I'll leave it at that. Trey Mosley graduated. That's a loss. Trey Mosley was good, but, you know, kind of hit his ceiling. He was kind of limited. He was a good, solid player. but And then you add TJ Sheffield. I think Sheffield's better than Trey Mosley. Will they get another wide receiver? They're going to be looking for one. So right now, you know, Henry's good. Had a real nice catch early in the year against Central Michigan. Would not be surprised if he does well at Wisconsin. You lose Chef, you lose Mosley, Sheffield's there. You sign Nick Marsh and Austin Clay. Like Nick Marsh a lot. So this was still to be determined a little bit. In terms of ready to play right now. 
Nick Marsh probably gets on the field. He might be a 10, 15 catch guy, maybe. Sheffield should be a 40, 50, 40 catch guy. You're losing Mosley, losing Henry. I'll tell you what, I would not trade Sheffield, Marsh, and Clay for Fitzpatrick, Henry, and Mosley. Even if I had another year of Mo- Mosley. So in that regard, I think wide receiver talent is up. But it might be to be determined down the road. And Austin Clay, an underrated member of this class. Offensive line. Short term, it's a downturn in talent. Long term, it's to be determined. Offensive line. You lose part-time starter Kevin Wigginton to Illinois. J.D. Duplain graduates. Nick Samak graduates. Spencer Brown goes to Oklahoma. I realize Spencer Brown wasn't great, but Oklahoma wanted him. But he's a starter. He's functional. Again, you're not bringing starters off the tuba section or the tennis team. So you're losing three and a half starters. Three starters. Wigginton was a spot starter in place of um, in place of Gino Vandemark. So who did you gain? Out of the portal, Tanner Miller. Tanner Miller, so far, he's a better player than all those guys in terms of what he did at Oregon State. Um, and you signed some good ones. I like the Lunieski twins. I liked... They're both pretty good now. One of them was much better than the other one in junior film. I think I'd have to check my 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 notes. But one of them was good as a junior. The other one was kind of okay. Got commitments for both of them. Senior film for both of them was quite good. I went over there. My thoughts on them before signing day, we could do that again as we head into the spring and so forth. But both those guys look pretty good. Rakeem Johnson, we talked about him. I could, we'll talk about these guys again in the future, and I'll get the video queued up because the video conked out on me last time. That's what got a new laptop, to, so the video is more conducive here. Rakeem Johnson, athletic, pull guard from Idaho. I mean, he runs... Looks like a defensive end. I think he's a guy that could play D-line. But with his mobility, and that's a compliment. If you say an offensive line, it could be a a legit D-lineman. and Maybe even a defensive end. That's what I mean by defensive lineman. He could be a defensive end for somebody. He could be like a Mac-level defensive end. So, Rakeem Johnson, I've not had a a lot of... I've not seen a lot of guys that look like him. So, uh, the frame of reference there, I'm curious to see what he's going to become because it's, it's uncommon. Peyton Stewart has some work to do. Rustin Young has some work to do. So, but, you know, when these guys signed offensive linemen at Oregon State, they signed guys, if you look at their high school film, that had work to do and they got the work done. So, long term, it's to be determined. Short term, I think Tanner, Tanner Miller's better than all the guys that left. Problem is, four guys left. So, the overall talent pool on the offensive line, I think, has gone down. Now, Miller's going to help. Maybe they'll get another one. They're going to go get another one out of the portal somewhere. The Newman kid from Holy Cross is going to look at it. I have not heard this, but it would not shock me if there's another Oregon State guy that comes in down the pike at some point. Not heard that at all. I've got no inside information on that. I just suspect that could be the case because there hasn't been a lot of movement with the portal. They've got some openings there, and they've not filled them. And I'm, That's curious. The Tanner Miller thing was a late-breaking deal. Didn't surprise me. I was just reading the tea leaves and looking at it from a pragmatic, what-makes-sense type of situation. Mahalchik and the offensive offensive line coach came here, had a great offensive line at Oregon State. A couple of those guys going pro and graduating. Maybe the starters will stay, but are there some second stringers there that might be inclined to leave? I'm just, I've not heard that at all. And they're very good at keeping things quiet. And they kept it quiet about Tanner Miller really, really well, too, until all of a sudden, oh, he visited and, and committed. Boom, boom. Happened real quick. Would not surprise me. But like I said, for the third time, I've not heard anything. And if I had heard it, then I wouldn't even bring it up. If I had heard it and was, sometimes you hear things and it's like, no, you can't go public with this, but this is what's going on. So you kind of have to use it. Because that's that's what, but because if you use it, then you don't you're you don't get that information for the next five ten years, and that can really be a problem. So if someone tells you don't put this out there yet, you don't. So if someone had told me that, then I wouldn't have even brought it up. But since no one's told me that, I can just kind of freewheeling guess, which sometimes turns out to be true. 
I did with Tanner Miller. I didn't know he was coming, but then all of a sudden I heard he was here and visiting and, and signed. I'm like, yep, made sense. It just made sense, right? So they've not added a lot out of the portal. It makes me wonder. So offensive line at this point, now Miller's better than those guys, but in terms of losing, Wigginton, Duplain, Samak, Brown, four starters, the overall talent in the offensive line has not increased yet. Now those guys that they signed, to be determined, because all offensive linemen, as a wise man once said, they're all projects to some extent. And I think some of those guys look pretty good. We'll see what the and, the... and these coaches have a great track record of developing offensive linemen. Down the road, it wouldn't surprise me if we looked back on this and said, wow, Michigan State lost Wigginton, Duplain, Samak, and Brown, and they were okay. Uh, you know, Samak and Duplain were okay, but had injuries, and they were okay. But wow, the Lunieskis and Rakeem Johnson and Rustin Young, those guys were, turned out to be way better. That might be the case in the future. I don't know. So offensive line, short-term minus long-term to be determined. Defensive line, still to be determined. Added Quinn Dunnigan from Middle Tennessee State. Second team, All-Conference USA. Added Daquan Dowes from Georgia Tech. Lost a lot of inconsequential guys. Brandon Wright was okay here and there. Jalen Sami, much respect, was damaged goods. Tumese Adelaye, DeAndre Butler got hurt, played well for a short period of time. Surprised me. I didn't forecast him to be as good as he was. He was good coming in from Liberty. Jared Jackson, I told you not to expect much. He played one game. He was damaged goods. No disrespect. I, you know, I, when Michigan State was getting those guys out of the portal and then letting guys go like Jalen Hunt and Deshaun Mallory, I know Jalen Hunt was high, what's the word? High maintenance. But there have been a lot of good defensive linemen over the years that were high maintenance. you got to find a way to keep those screws tight. You let those guys go and you bring in Adelaide, Sami, DeAndre Butler, Jared Jackson, talking like that was going to change everything. All right, so Dunnigan, Douse. I think Douse is kind of, uh, I got to watch some film of him, but don't expect him to be a savior or anything. I think it could be maybe a DeAndre Butler type of guy, Dre Butler. I would hope he would be better than Sami and Jared Jackson. I think he will be. Zion Young is the question here. Zion Young, official visit. He's in the portal, visited Florida State, visited Missouri. Uh, I've got a question here. Someone asked me about Zion Young. I've heard, you know, that things uh, have t- are still good with him, or they're they're creeping toward good. You know, Michigan State has, has you know, they're they're working NIL deals, right? Everybody knows this, so that's what it comes down to. The guy wants to stay, so NIL coffers. Have to wait and see. I've heard. I heard yesterday that that there was a feeling that things were looking good. And some of you might say, well, Comperoni, you said that things were looking good for Jacoby Winman at one point too. And they were looking good because Jacoby was listening and he wanted to stay, but the NIL didn't make, make as much sense. The NIL offer came in from Michigan State, but he looked at the, his whole situation. I think he's 23 years old right now, right? Had a couple injuries. Not the least of which, he sees Ben Van Sumeren, who really struggled at Michigan State, a linebacker. Different types of linebackers. But if you're Jacoby Winman, you look at Van Sumeren, you look at yourself, and you're like, I'm better than that guy. And that guy got a free agent opportunity, made the tra- the taxi squad, the travel, t- the uh, scout team, whatever they call it in the NFL, and with injuries moved up, up to the, into the playing group and started for the Eagles. I mean, the money there, when you start a couple games in the NFL, and great for Van Sumeren. Because Van Sumeren struggled at Michigan State. Very good athlete, but was downstream all the time, really never defeated blocks, and really didn't seem to know what to do. Tried, but they had a lot of players like that that were trying, but were like, wrong, wrong. Go watch it. Amir Speed, Angelo Gross, he's, he's coming back. We'll see if he improves. Noah Harvey, bam. And then toward the end of his career, he got, a, got some traction again. Corveris Crouch. So when there's so many people that didn't seem to know what to do, at some point I stopped blaming the players. I stopped blaming the players. So Van Sumeren gets 
gets a free agent tryout because he goes and jumps 42 inches and runs a 4-5. or five. And the Eagles are like, well, that dude, his college film is not good. But that guy's a hunk of an athlete right there. So they gave him a shot as a, as a project. They worked with him. And then he was starting late in the year. And he's a, he's a guy. I watched that game. He made some plays downhill when they won gapped. He got downhill and made some plays. He still, it's the NFL, I realize that. Still struggles to defeat blocks. For as athletic as Van Sumeren is, he still struggles to get off blocks. But the feet get moving. And you see, you saw that a little bit early in the year in 2022 when he was playing outside linebacker against Western Michigan. They threw a couple swing passes. And he saw the speed flash. When the ball's out there and just chase ball, you saw the speed. But... Traditional inside linebacker duties. He's kind of out to lunch. And you know what? I don't blame him. And I wish him the best with the Eagles. So how do I get started? How do I start? Oh, how do I start talking about that? Oh, Jacoby Winman. So he sees Van Sumer and he's like, I, if he can play in the NFL, I can too. Difference is Van Sumer got his shot on raw athletic ability. Winman has some athletic ability too. Different kind. And, you know, he's he's Applying for the, he's, he's made himself available for the NFL draft. Maybe he'll put up good numbers in the t-shirt camps and the, and the combines. And maybe he will get drafted. I don't know. But he's, at, at worst, he's hoping to catch on as a free agent. And he's betting on himself that he can make a practice squad. That's the term I was looking for. Make the practice squad and pull a Van Sumeren. And if you do that, that would be like, he'd make four times, five times as much as his NIL offer. So he's betting on himself. He could take a small NIL offer, stay here, hope to have a good season, get drafted, or bet on himself right now, turn pro, and let it roll. So he wanted to come back. If the NIL offer had been bigger, he would have come back. I'm not saying Michigan State was wrong to offer what they could. You can only offer what you've got. So, And I thought he would have been a good addition. I thought he had good leadership skills. Maybe the coaches put a different value on it. I don't know. But... When I told you a couple weeks ago that things were positive and looking positive for Jacoby Winman, I knew that because I knew that he was interested in coming back and he was listening. But ultimately, the, the professional choice was to bet on himself in the pro ranks rather than take what was... Because if he goes pro ranks, there's there's less of a ceiling. You look at Van Sumeren, you know, he, may, he gets the practice squad... Then he makes the 44-man roster, 45-man roster, however many numbers it is, and then gets on the field. So there was no ceiling. If you take an NIL deal, there's a ceiling right now. you know. So Winman made a good business decision for himself. But I'm just explaining that because a couple of weeks ago I was saying that things were looking good. But then toward the end I said I kind of backed off on that and said that things were kind of... Um, turning around a little bit on that. So linebacker. So Zion Young anyway. So on defensive line, if you if Michigan State keeps Zion Young, then it's a D-line upgrade. If they lose Zion Young, <clears throat> then it's an overall defensive line downturn. But I'm put a pause on that. Because I need to watch Quinn Dunnigan. I've not watched his film yet. So I'm kind of... I shouldn't even make that declaration. But if Zion Young comes back, then then it's that. But I still need to watch Dunnigan. Linebacker. Added Jordan Turner. Signed Brady Pretzlaff. They lost Jacoby Winman. Aaron Brule. Quivarian Carter. By the way, it's my understanding that the current staff saw Jacoby Winman not as a linebacker, but as a stand-up defensive end. And sometimes hand-down defensive end. So when he didn't stay, they felt they were losing a defensive end rather than a linebacker. So they must think that they've got linebackers, or maybe they want to add more. But Jordan Turner, Pretzlaff, but you lose Winman, Brule. Brule had a pretty good senior year. I thought he was a standout guy, did a pretty good job. And linebacker, they lose Quivarian Carter, who never got on the field, never put shoulder pads on. They did not lose Jordan Hall. That's a plus. And they did not lose Darius Snow. We'll see what that amounts to. I love Darius Snow as a kid. I hope that for his sake that and for the program's sake, if you're rooting for the program, I'm just your friendly correspondent. If Darius Snow does have his speed back, then that's a plus. But I like Jordan Turner. I got to watch some more film of him. 
I remember him, but I need to zero in on it a little bit more. His role reduced a little bit this year with the new coaches at Wisconsin for whatever reason. He's a Michigander coming home, and he's excited. Pretz laugh. I like him for the future. <clears throat> um, but Turner and Pretzlaff, are they better than Winman and Brulee right now? Not not right now. I, I wouldn't think so. Pretzlaff might be good in the future. <clears throat> Overall talent. Pool. The big win there is keeping Jordan Hall. He's got some leadership ability, among other things. But overall, you're losing a senior, Brulee, and Winman goes pro. I don't think that that's a talent upgrade. Jordan Turner might prove me wrong. Pretz left down the road could be good, but right now, better than what they had in 2023 at linebacker. Uh, and you still have Halliday, but that's neutral. <clears throat> I'm just talking about in terms of drops and ads. So linebacker, I'm going to say, even though Turner was a nice pickup, I'm still saying Winman and Brulee, who were not great, but they were good, and Winman was hurt for nine games. Um, but if Brulee and Winman had been healthy all year, I think that that linebacker tandem would have been better than what we'll see next year, waiting to see what happens with Matthews and some others in the portal. So that one is still to be determined, but as of right now, I can't say that linebacker has improved. You're asking me overall, has the roster improved? So we're going over a position by position. <clears throat> Defensive backs. Defensive backs added. We're going to be adding Tony Grimes, it sounds like. I don't know. Did I speak out of turn on that one? All right, I'm not, I'm, I can't remember if I was told that he's for sure or it's or it's happening. Not sure. I'm, I'm just going to cut that one off. But linebackers overall, it's going to be a plus, I would think, because you lost Chester Kimbrough to graduation, and you're not, and you're, if you add anybody, it's a plus, and they're going to be adding people. <clears throat> um, they signed Justin Denson, Jalen Thompson, Andrew Brinson, Kashawn Williams. You know, I, I I did some extensive breakdowns on those guys before signing day, but off the top of my head, I'd have to go back. You know, I was I was writing this down, and it was like ten after it was like ten after nine. I'm like, I got to start this thing. I got to start Spartan Mag Live. So I'd have to go back and and refresh my memory of my notes on those guys. That's why I go over these questions beforehand because you don't want me coming up here and just like reading the question for the first time and, and like stalling and not having any decent answers. So I try to research some of the answers. So that's kind of hopefully what makes some of this work. Defensive backs, got to tell you, I would have had to go back and, and relook at their film and look at my notes again to remember what Denson, Thompson, Brinson, and Williams and what I thought about them. Because I'm an old man and I can't remember things as well as I used to. I can tell you right now that I like the fact in 1996 when they when they signed Ivory McCoy as a defensive end out of Chicago Simeon, I think it was. I like the fact that he had good straight line speed and he could do the splits. I can remember that. I had a younger brain back then. Um, the best plus for the defensive backfield is that they did not lose Chance Rucker, Dylan Tatum, Jalen, uh, Jaden Mangum, and Malik Spencer. That's the good news. So anything added to the defensive backfield is a plus. Question 11, before we figure, before we sign off, let me see if I can go through these real quick. Question 11, Sparty from Pauly's Island, South Carolina. Pauly's Island, South Kakalaki. He says, hey, Jim, just wondering how Jerry Jeremy Fears is progressing and also if you think Jackson Kohler will be in, in the starting lineup anytime soon. Jeremy Fears saw him today during practice. He was working with a trainer and very carefully doing some rehabilitation. Also, he's doing some shooting against the wall. Um, you know, has something on his leg. It's not like a huge brace or anything. He's not in crutches, but he's just, it's very gingerly right now. They're going at a pace, and I wish him the best. You never know. You know I was talking to some coaches about that. When the femur, when the bone is impacted by something like that, you just never know what the horsepower level is going to be when he comes back, and everybody's hoping and praying. I mean, his health is fine. Could have been so much worse. Thank goodness it wasn't worse. Gosh, I don't know if Izzo would have been able to survive that. I don't know if he would have been able to. Honestly, I don't know if he could have kept coaching. I mean, he would have finished the year, but that if that would have went worse, that would have knocked him over the edge, I think. Jeez. So, but he's 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 putting weight on it, no crutches. So, but, you know, that that's going to take a while. I don't think anyone's expecting, you know, anything... Um, I don't know. It's going to take a while. For Kohler, um, 
you know, lateral movement was a situation for him last year. He lost some weight during the offseason, and that was getting better. Then he has lower body injury, and he couldn't work on lower on lateral movement. So the change of direction is is not great. And can it get better in the weeks ahead? Maybe. Where would he be if he hadn't gotten hurt? You know, Izzo was kind of mentioned that rhetorically today. You know, would he be starting? Maybe. You know, the offensive skill is excellent, but this is not a program that could hide him in his zone defense. And ball screen defense is so important. You know, he'll get some chances, but he might get uh, have some problems when it, when it comes to ball screen defense. And if you have problems with ball screen defense at the center position, you can't play. And last year... He was surpassed by Carson Cooper because Cooper could do that. Even though Kohler has much better ball skill, if you can't play ball screen defense, the boat don't float. Jackson Kohler doing everything he can. Good kid, good skill, tough break with the injury. Do I think he'll be starting anytime soon, you're asking? Anytime soon? No. No, I don't. It's going to take a, take a while. Question 12, Ronnie M. from Grozeal. Or Grozeal. I think they say down there. Jim, with the expansion of 12 teams, what is your prediction regarding the future of other bowl games? Will they become irrelevant? Um, irrelevant to the to people that aren't betting or people that have nothing better to do than watch college football and irrelevant to the people that are not participating. However, if you're a Michigan State fan and they're playing Oregon in the Red Box Bowl in San Francisco and the game's on television, you're going to be watching. And like I wrote that day and like I'll write in the future, that you can say the Red Box Bowl or whatever bowl it is, the Poinsettia Bowl it used to be called, or whatever bowl it is, the Music City Bowl. You may say that they don't count or don't matter until your team loses in one of those. And then it kind of pisses you off. And you're like, why did we lose to Oregon 7 nothing? We could have beaten Oregon. And that's what I wrote that day. Michigan State screwed up. A, was it 7-3? Michigan State f- screwed up. A, was it a fake field goal that they screwed up? They missed a field goal, then they screwed up a fake field goal. Had the play, but like someone dropped it. Can't remember the specifics. But wouldn't it look good on Michigan State's bowl history right now if you had a win over Oregon? Even though both teams were 500 teams back then. Neither team was very good. Even though they had Herbert, first-round draft pick quarterback, Beat Oregon in a bowl game, looks good. Beat TCU in the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl, looks good on your bowl history. You lose it, you're frustrated. You can say it doesn't matter until you lose one of those games. These days, with all the opt-outs, it means less and less to the point that they're becoming what they originally were back in the 30s, which is a postseason exhibition. Up until 1967, they awarded the national championship before the bowl games were played. Many of you know that. Michigan State won the 1965 national championship and then went and lost the Rose Bowl. There were other years that they won a bowl game, and if the, was it 50, 54? There was one year where Michigan State won the Rose Bowl, and I think, like Maryland was the national champion, but lost the Orange Bowl, that if there had been a vote, Michigan State might have won the the vote, post-bowl vote after that. Although I think Tennessee beat Maryland, Maryland and they might have gotten the vote. I don't know. But anyway, there have been others that have won national championships while losing their bowl game. Because back then, the bowl games were an exhibition. Increasingly, they're becoming an exhibition again. But they still count on the record increasingly it's not an exhibition for this year. Increasingly it's becoming a preview for next year. For instance, LSU beats Wisconsin in the bowl game. Garrett Nussmeyer is the quarterback. That's next year's quarterback. It's a preview toward a lot of next year's team. If people look at them in that regard, they don't mean as much, but they'll still mean something. Because if nothing else, it's next year's players getting a shot. And... People that are real Michigan State football fans and real college football fans will find value in that for their own team. Does the outcome of the game mean as much as it used to? No. That's that's what you lose. No, it won't. And 12 teams make the playoff. And those 12, if you're not in those 12, you had a bad season now. That's going to be tough on coaches. I still like the old days. I mean, I'll just point to one season in particular, and I, and I often do. Was it 19... 
1990, Michigan State is, gets a four-way tie for a Big Ten championship. That's good, and it's a very good 1990 team. They beat number one Michigan that, that year, almost beat number one Notre Dame. Lost to Illinois. Was that, No, 1990, they lost at Iowa. And lost to, at Illinois, too, right? So four teams had two losses. Anyway, good Michigan State team. They play in the Sun Bowl. They play USC with Todd Marinovich, who had a lot of publicity, a lot of Sports Illustrated fame back when Sports Illustrated was ruled the world. And Michigan State went and beat USC, a hard-hitting game. Hard-hitting game. Classic George Perlis football. Beat USC, beat Marinovich, won the bowl game, came off the field, and that's a good season. That's a very good season. That was perceived as a very good season. I think Michigan State finished number 16 in the polls that year, 18 or 19. And like George Perlis used to say, he liked the bowl system because it gives 20 teams a chance to win a bowl game, finish the season with a win, win a t- wear a T-shirt all summer saying we won the bowl game. And he was right. It was good, and we liked it. Now, 12 teams make the playoff. 11 of them are going home losers. For some, it will be an accomplishment to get there. But for a lot, they're going to get into that Jim Trestle syndrome. You know the Jim Trestle syndrome, right? He won a national title in 2002. And then he went and played for two more against LSU and Florida. Got blown out both times. And everybody was mad at him because he lost in the national championship game. What? You're number two in the country and everybody's mad at you? Back in the old days, that team goes to the Rose Bowl, wins the Rose Bowl. They wear a T-shirt. They finish number two in the country or number one. Let's say they finish number two with a win and everybody's happy. And they complain a little bit because we didn't find out on the field. Maybe it's better this way. It is better this way from a competitive standpoint. But in terms of leaving a lot of fans angry, it's going to leave a lot of fans angry. And if you don't make the 12, people are going to get fired for not making the 12. And then if you're 13 or 14 and you play in the Music City Bowl and your players opt out, then it's a preview toward next year. And it's tough. I wonder if some of those games, you might not keep your seniors around for it, but what about moving some of those games to April after spring football, at the end of spring football? Would you go to a bowl game in Orlando on April 15th if you have four months to plan for it? If on Selection Sunday you find out who the 12 teams are, and then you find out the next tier of bowls, then you find these these teams are going to be playing bowls in Florida in April. Well, these other next tier, they're probably going to get upset. They're going to say, wait a minute, we, we didn't make the 12, and we don't want to play in the, in, the, in the Gator Bowl. We'd rather play in the spring. I don't know, maybe, maybe a bunch of horse trading goes on. Your seniors will opt out because that's right around draft time. That's okay. In this day and age of mid-year enrollees, your true freshmen play. Now, are you subjecting players to injury? Yes. Are you for a spring game? Yes. That'd have to be weighed. Coaches don't get to make these decisions. A lot of times, decisions like these are made by television companies. And if broadcast companies come to the athletic directors and say, this is what we'd like to do in April, I don't know. Coaches get no say in these things. Just a thought. I'm not saying the world would be better that way. Just throwing it out there. Just spitballing here. Question 13. George from the Motor City says, anything on Zion Jones? Zion Zion Young. Zion Young. Um, Zion Williams. It's getting old. i got to shut this off. Uh, Missouri, Florida State. Michigan State still in there. I mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, Mooby also heard that, that things were looking good for Zion Young. So we'll see what that means. Mahan from Okemos. <clears throat> says, can you break down the type of offense Coach Smith is known for and how it is different than other teams in the Big Ten? He's known for having a lot under center, more under center than most teams. It's sometimes it was more than 50% under center rather than shotgun. They'll go shotgun also. They'll spread it out and they'll throw downfield. But they were a knuckleball in the Pac-12. They went under, under center and they were two tight ends a lot and physical inside zone. I have to look more to see what some of the blocking schemes I've watched them, but it's it's and it's uh, that was November between the tackles, <clears throat> similar somewhere between Michigan and Iowa, and I mean like the good Iowa, like the the Brian Banks Iowa, in terms of tight ends, outside zone, counter boot, crossing routes, drags. <clears throat> um, 
with more talented quarterbacks and wide receivers than Iowa. Like they're what Iowa wishes they could be, but they'll spread it out and incorporate that way more than Iowa does. So like somewhere between Michigan and Iowa. Um, when they got it rolling. So that's kind of kind of what they do. Question is, that was a good knuckleball for out west. It is a Midwestern style. Will it be less of a knuckleball here? Don't know. But he's he's intelligent. He's a former quarterback. He's pragmatic. Um, that whole construct's in good hands. Jeff from Franklin, Michigan says, seven wins in 2024. Are you taking the over or the under? Good question. I'm not ready to comment on that yet. Tim from Ypsilanti says, hate to ask you about school down the road, but do you foresee, in your honest opinion, any real impactful punishment coming from the notice of violations for recruitment and or scouting steel signing? Um, And we had other questions. I don't have time for them. I didn't have time to get to them before the show. Planning to go to Illinois. I don't want to say that. We'll see. Um, Wondering if I could get to those other questions or not. But we went through the Michigan thing earlier. <clears throat> so we answered your question ahead of time. Let's go over here to the comments and reactions. <clears throat> yeah, LFG says, you have, you have Michigan acknowledged guilt via not challenging the Big Ten findings in court. That's the way I see it. So they're not allegations. People that are putting this out there as allegations of scenes, sign stealing. Um, they're the same clowns that said it was over a cheeseburger. So... Same mindset, same shills. Mark Webster says the NCAA is going to back off if Harbs goes to the NFL. They are weak now and don't want to further lose position over the CF college football, over college football. If this happens in 2013, they get a bull ban 100%. In 2013, yes. I agree with that. If it happens back then, it's a bigger deal. But right now, like what I was saying, and you're kind of, um, you're kind of agreeing with it, that uh, the NCA on this decision has to figure out not what's right or wrong, but what is li- less likely to hurt themselves as a governing body and an entity going forward. Because there's a lot of athletic directors out there that are saying we don't even need the NCAA, and there's I don't there's people out there saying let's form our own association. So the NCAA is aware of that. Do they drop a hammer on Michigan? Does that hurt them? Does that hurt the NCAA in their quest to keep the revolution down? Probably not. Baird's Bikes Videos, Mike from Battle Creek, Michigan. Says Michigan and Integrity are complete opposites. I'm not going to read all these. JJ McKay says, I hope Smith does what he did with DJ Uyungle and Childs, where the backup gets likely every third possession most of the time. <clears throat> That's all well and good if your backup is Aiden Childs in 2023. In 2024, the backup... Might not be that great, but it's good that they've got Schuster in there as part of it. And the freshman, we'll have to see. I'm going to have to just, uh, I appreciate all the comments. I think we're going to have to run along. Oh, I didn't ask uh, Stanton Ramil. Stanton Ramil, I loved his high school film. He did a really good job at uh, the Mississippi-Alabama All-Star game. A lot of people thought Michigan State got a steal. And I did too. Big, athletic. Had a pretty tough injury, so we didn't get to see him at all in the field this fall. Didn't get to hear how he was coming along. Um, I thought he had a really good future before the injury. We'll see how he comes out of it. With an injury like that, likely not to be in contact this spring. I've not heard that specifically, but I would not be surprised. So, he's a tackle, good prospect. Would I expect him to overtake Brandon Baldwin or Ethan Boyd at this stage, like next fall, I wouldn't expect it. But if he heals properly, I think he's got a real good future. <clears throat> All right, we're going to 
it's it's time to go. I appreciate everybody and all the um all the support. It's Doug Karen from St. Ignace. Um, then stop at Clyde's for a big C. What else is going on here? Northern Michigan begins once you pass Clarkston. <laughs> no. What are you guys talking about here? Thomas Yowett from Traverse City. Tom Helderin says is MSU 66. Tom and Tanya watching and enjoying. Go green. Best wishes to you, Tom and Tanya. We love you. And living in Keweenaw. Awesome. Yeah, that's where uh, JJ McKay's from north of Calumet in Mohawk. That is serious copper country up there. Did I say car to someone else? I meant to say Houston. I might have said something else. Evan Morris went to Central Florida. Oh, I, don't, I might have said something else. Sometimes my brain thinks one thing, but my mouth says something else. And that's gotten me in trouble more than a few times, I might add. Brian Pettit from North Carolina chiming in. Baird's Bikes video says Chris Bird used to fight a lot on Tuesday Night Fights. Chris Bird from Flint. Sean O'Grady was the color commentator, usually with what? Was it? I uh, can't remember who the play-by-play guy. It might have been one of, the, one of the Alberts. They had Tuesday night fights in the Lansing Civic Center at least once, maybe twice. Roger Turner fighting over there. Joe Lipsy over there. So Bob Every was doing the promotions, doing a good job. That was fun. He used to be a big boxing guy. Who else do we have here? Thomas Yout says, is this a geography podcast or an MSU sports podcast? Apologize. I think it's about it. Rustin Young, he was the one, I guess. All right, I'm starting to bore everybody. I'm just kind of dragging, make sure I didn't miss anything. Matt Latham, great to hear from him. My nephew's number 11, Alan McGrew. I'll look for him. Thank you, J.J. McKay. East Lansing High School. Uh, LFG says, the standard truck stop in Heartland at M59, one, uh, 123 Junction. I don't know what you're talking about there, but YT Sparty says, there's a truck stop in Heartland. I remember as a kid loving their breakfast. Are you guys talking about Oasis Truck Plaza? You guys remember Oasis Truck Plaza? Now that is some big time. Heartland, 1970s trivia. Oasis Truck Plaza, they sponsored our uh, Little League team when I was like in third grade. And yeah, we won the trophy. Envious Gaming says Kiss played there once. The skating rink in Heartland. It's a Heartland reunion, I'm sorry about this. Yes, Kiss played Heartland, venue 75, 76. Talking about Oasis Truck Plaza? Um, it's not called that anymore. Madonna. Madonna. I don't know. She went to Michigan. Was it the real Michigan? Did she go to the Ann Arbor dance scholarship or something? I'll give her a pass. She was the one cute one. Some of you may disagree with that. And you're entitled to disagree. Was that, was that, was that sexist? I apologize. Apologize. I don't. I don't want to offend anybody. Jordan Simmons was death. Simmons, yeah, Simmons was okay in pass pass protection. Uh, you know, a lot of you guys chiming in before I sign off. True ambition says Tanner Miller is not better than JD or Samac. Interesting. We'll find out. No disrespect to Samac and 
Duplain, they're they're okay. When healthy, they were good, solid college football players. But Tanner Miller, I, I'm I'm gonna have to um, I'm gonna have to study that a little bit more. Okay, LFG is getting me on the live bullet thing from Birmingham, Michigan. Yeah. Uh, LFG says, you guys know better north of Harrison around Grayling, Gaylord, Roscommon to me in 1972 was where up north started. So this one's from 72 also. It's called Turn the Page. Now, um, that's where LFG says up north started, around Harrison. I would agree with that. That's right around Harrison. When you get to, Harrison's not quite to Claire, but the trees do. Harrison is kind of... It's... it's um, it's the black, you know, like uh, the home plate. You've got a home plate and then the black. And if you're throwing on the black, sometimes umpires will give you the black. Harrison is the black to up north. Eddie McBucket's checking in from Pentwater, which is, in my opinion, the western border of up north. All right, a lot of you guys. All right, we're gonna, uh, now I'm just, I, I got to sign this off. Okay, appreciate it. Everybody, uh, Sparty Party MSU says Michigan State versus Illinois on Thursday is going to be interesting. It is going to be interesting. Michigan State's going to be an underdog if they're not already. I'm sure they are already. Illinois, number nine in the country, can be very difficult. Illinois, six days rest coming off a loss. Um, Very difficult. Michigan State's going to be up for it, bringing a lot of energy. A win would be mammoth. It's going to be difficult. Appreciate everybody checking in. Go to SpartanMag.com. Become a subscriber. We'll see you next time. Thanks to everybody for all the comments and all the questions. We'll see you next time, everybody. Be good. Take care of one another. Be good. And we'll see you next time Spartan Mag Live. Thank you.